Um, good morning, members. We have a quorum, and can I call the meeting to order, please? I declare the meeting open to the public online. I would like to welcome members participating by phone this morning. Um, do we have Orlea there on phone? Yes, Chair. Yeah. Orlea Flynn and Pam, you're there on the phone also? I am indeed. Thank you, yeah. Chair. Thank you. So, can I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? Um, we have no apologies for this morning, and um, in terms of chairperson's business, I did a number of media interviews this week in relation to um, care homes in particular, and we will, we will come back to that um, very shortly. In terms of the minutes there, um, item three, I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on 30th of April, which are tab, tab 3.1 of your meeting pack. Are members content with those minutes? Yep, content, thank you. Matters arising, I may advise members that there are no matters arising at present. So, we are now moving to COVID, the, the main briefing this morning from the Public Health Agency, a COVID-19 disease response briefing from them. I would advise members that officials from the Public Health Agency are joining us by telephone conferencing to discuss latest developments in responding to COVID-19, including issues around testing, contact tracing, PPE and engagement with care homes. I refer members to tab five of the table papers. And I just want to, to check if we have the members on, on the phone here. We may need to cut pause a couple of minutes just to bring in all the, the panel from the PHA. But can I check? Do we have Dr. Breach Farrell at present? Do we have Dr. Jackie Highland? Yes, Dr. here. Professor Hugo Van Weerden? Yes. Uh, Olive, Miss Olive McLeod? Yes. Okay, I'm going to just check again. Do we have Breed Farrell? Breed, are you on the line? We seem to have lost Breed there at the minute. We'll just pause there for a couple of oh. minutes to try to get Breed on the line, and then we will resume. So we'll pause the meeting yeah, now for a couple great. of minutes. If you go here, I'll just double check with Breed on the phone. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland. Okay, we'll now resume. And can I welcome Ms. Olive McLeod, Interim Chief Executive, Professor Hugo Van Weerden, Director of Public Health, Dr. Jackie Highland, Consultant in Public Health, and Dr. Breege Farrell, Assistant Director of Service Development, Safety and Quality. Um, you're very welcome to the meeting this morning, and I now invite you to go ahead and brief the meeting, please. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity for updating you in relation to the contact tracing program we're developing here in the Public Health Agency. Olive, Olive we're, having, we're having difficulty hearing you. Can you move closer to the phone or, or speak up a little, please? 
yes, yes. Can you hear me now? That's better, yes. Okay, okay. I'll shout a little. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for speaking with you this morning and updating you in relation to the Northern Ireland contact tracing program. The, the purpose of the program is to slow the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic in Northern Ireland and lessen the impact on the health and social care services through preventing community transmission of COVID when social distancing measures are relaxed. We'll do this by identifying cases of COVID, we'll trace their contacts, we'll offer them testing, and if symptomatic, public health advice. Our purpose is to establish a large-scale contact tracing program for cases of COVID positive commencing next week, the week of the 11th. The objective is to deliver a contact tracing program in a number of locations in Northern Ireland. We, will, we are currently um, confirming the service model. We are recruiting and training suitably experienced staff. We are working to provide uh, appropriate IT platforms to support this work. We are identifying and securing other resources, including finance, to support this work. And we are uh, uh, arranging appropriate governance, progress management, and administrative support. This piece of work has been led by Dr. Jackie Highland. And Jackie has uh, much experience in contact tracing, and we're really very pleased that she is leading this work for us. I'm going to pass over now to Jackie to, to describe the work the project, the initial pilot, and the forward program um, that we have prepared. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is describe um, how we moved into the position we're in in terms of public health management of uh, a large incident such as a pandemic. Um, to give you some context, uh, everybody became aware of this December and January and we started to receive information through the World Health Organization about the infection and the, the, the novel approach it was taking. So at that point, we started um, the usual public health contact tracing by understanding the kind of risks people might put themselves at in which they become infected. So the initial contact tracing was based on the fact that anybody who came from Wuhan had a temperature and breathlessness and a cough could be possibly suffering from COVID. So at that point in Northern Ireland, there were very few people that fit that criteria. So it was relatively easy to do the contact tracing for their contacts. It became a little bit more extended whenever we passed on to understanding that it was a Hubei province. And again, we were looking at people in terms of symptoms, temperature, cough, and breathlessness. However, it rapidly expanded across the world with the first big cases arising in Italy. And on that basis, the definition had to be changed again to include a wider group of countries. And on that basis, it became even more difficult to follow the contacts. Because as you can imagine, as soon as we looked at people who came from Wuhan and Hubei and passed them, other people had come in, for example, from Italy and Germany and Austria who hadn't been part of that definition and had started to spread the infection. And only then, when we were informed that these were all also countries that were affected, did the definition expand. But as many countries in Europe then found, the disease had spread so quickly that it was no longer possible to contact all the people who were there. The difference between us and other countries such as Korea is Korea had some experience in the past through the SARS incident several years ago in which they had set up very rapid testing procedures. Because of their ability to scale up testing to the thousands within weeks of the process, their case definition included a test, a positive test, so they could whittle down all the people who come from areas who had had symptoms of cough, temperature, and breathlessness, which are very broad symptoms, that they could test them quickly and pin down specifically only those who were likely to be ill and only those who were likely to be their contacts. However, in the rest of Europe and other parts of the world, because the testing was very new and the systems weren't up and going, we were totally reliant on a definition for symptoms. The only other way to manage the spread of disease in those cases is very crude, and it is closing down the whole society, and that's to break the chain of infection. So to isolate everybody, assuming everybody possibly has the infection. So that's what happens when we have the lockdown. And we have to go through that until the levels of infection throughout the communities are slowing down 
and people aren't connecting and the disease is no longer spreading. When we see that happening, as we're beginning to see now, and Northern Ireland has been quite successful in getting to this position relatively quickly because people have been listening to the messages. When we see that, then we have to start releasing social isolation because of the other consequences in terms of economic and social well-being. We're now at that stage. So a few weeks ago, seeing this was coming in Northern Ireland a little bit earlier than other places in terms of our, our relative success in monitoring the and managing the outbreak because of people's adherence to guidance, we started looking at setting up a pilot for the contact tracing. The aim of the pilot is whenever people start moving around is to stop any little clusters which start to evolve. So as people go into workplaces, one or two people may still have infection and they spread it to others. We need to get there very, very quickly and stop that spread in that workplace setting, moving out into other parts of the community. So we started designing the pilot um, early to mid-April and we started a little team uh, working together about the 15th of April to look at four key things that we need to develop to start the contact tracing centre. Four main things we needed to do was firstly recruitment in terms of getting people into the place and getting them appropriately trained. The second thing was the training package, looking at all the guidance at the moment and making sure we were in line with uh, World Health Organisation and European guidance. The third thing was getting facilities that would uh, keep people in a safe place so they had to have enough spacing between them and we had to get equipment and IT to them. And the fourth thing was setting up a database so that we can now collect the cases and their contacts and very quickly identify any clusters which are evolving either geographically or in certain social groups because of the behaviour of what they're doing. So that pilot started on the 27th of April, uh, about 15 days after we started thinking about this. I came together very well because everybody really wants to make a difference here. And people move mountains, to be honest, to get us going in terms of databases and in terms of recruitment. We are piloting now um, until the uh, 25th of May. Uh, we have started some cases coming through the system. Um, individuals have been trained and are now using the system and we are contacting cases uh, and their contacts and we are providing them with advice on isolation. In any case who is symptomatic and in a key worker grouping will be advised to go and get testing. If they turn out to be positive, it will come back into the system and we'll be able to identify <coughs> further contacts from within that. So at this stage, the pilot is up and running. We are ironing out any problems, and problems specifically uh, relate to issues such as bringing together IT systems, which historically have always been fairly isolated or evolving independently. But people are making great moves in actually bringing this together, but there's more to be done. The other issue we have is making sure that we have contact numbers for everybody, because while we get lab results, they would normally go to GPs or hospitals and they'd be told this result by the clinician. That's no longer feasible because of the large numbers we're going to see. Um, so we are now trying to find ways of getting phone numbers, something as basic as phone numbers so we can phone people back. These are the kind of things that we need to work through in the pilot. And once we get these sorted out, we will start the full program running, taking every case every day and contacting all those contacts within a period of 24 hours to make sure we are on top of things. Now, getting the contacts depends on two things. It depends on one, they're answering their phone, and two, are having that phone number to start with. Um, so those are the key critical issues we are working on at the moment. But I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, you um, <clears throat> are aware of the serious situation that's developing within the care homes, and I know that Public Health Agency were previously involved in publishing and collecting and publishing the data. Um, it's fair to say that you, you need information to be able to concentrate resources and to, to be able to, to fight this. It's also fair to say, that, and very important to say, that people are absolutely entitled, who have loved ones within care homes, are absolutely entitled to know what the situation is in the care home in which their loved one is living. So can you give us uh, your view of the need to publish data uh, on time, accurate, and meaningful data in relation to care homes and the, the, the transmission and spread and extent of coronavirus within our care home sector, impacting some of the most vulnerable in our society. Dear, um, this is Olive McLeod, and I'm happy to start, and I'll, ha I'll hand over to, to, to Hugo to answer. But to advise you that all outbreaks must be reported to the Public Health Agency. 
coronavirus is a, is a reportable uh, infection with to us. So on a daily basis, every home must advise us if they believe they have patients with respiratory symptoms. If they meet the definition, and the definition currently is, if anybody has a respiratory illness, they are swabbed. If there is one person, if there are two or more, everybody in the home is swabbed, including the staff. We, on a daily basis, monitor that home. They send a return to us on a daily basis. We speak with them on a daily basis. We provide them with advice and support, and we monitor those homes until the uh, outbreak is over. The outbreak is only over when the last person is 14 days since their last symptom. That home then must have what we describe as a terminal clean. That means that everything in the home is cleaned uh, uh, to a very high standard, and only then will the home be declared uh, free of respiratory infection or COVID and allowed to take new patients in. So we, we are satisfied that we are actively monitoring and supporting the homes, as are the trusts who commission the care, and as are RQIA, who are the regulator, and who, where there are concerns, go out and inspect. They are doing a small number of inspections currently because of the risk in the homes. So in relation to every home in Northern Ireland, we monitor it on a daily basis. Um, we are satisfied that the home managers make sure the families understand that there is an outbreak in the home and, and that is the reason why they cannot visit to c try and contain and control further spread of infection to this very vulnerable group of people. But what's your view in terms of communicating with families the extent? You've said that, you said that where there is an outbreak, and I think, I think the committee have, have generally in the past said that all these, every, every care home is vulnerable. And it, it, would be, it would be a view of many that testing uh, of both staff and, and patients, residents, should be taking place across all of our care homes. But in relation to sharing information with families, is it, is it good enough? Uh, my, we can tell you that families it is standard practice where there is an outbreak in a home uh, that families are notified. There is flu every year and families are notified and the way we contain any spread of infection is to contain um, uh, visiting and make sure that there are good infection control practices in that home. Uh, that is tested when our QIA are out on inspection, uh, but for us, uh, we have very close uh, working relations with the home, and I would believe it is up to the homes to advise families where there is an outbreak and help them understand all of the measures that they are taking to keep their loved ones safe. Okay, I'm going to take a quick round of questions from members in relation to the to care home sector in light, of, in light of the significant concern that there is out there, because I want to come back also to the, the other issues around the arrangements that are in place for significantly increased testing and tracing, and I want to explore the, uh, the, the, the actual mechanisms that are in place to do that. So I'm going to take a quick round of questions, and I've got asked members to go with one question each on this issue, and we'll come back for a second round. So I have indications from Colin, Paula, Jerry, and Alex at this stage, and then I'll go to the phones. Thank you very much, Chair. And yes, just uh, recognising some of the um, disturbing information that's coming out today about the care home sector. And given that the PHA has as its key aim health protection, could, could I ask the, the, the panel then, given that on the 20th of February and the 19th of March they had bo board meetings where they never once mentioned care homes, um, can I ask them what they've specifically done to protect uh, people in the care home sector, given that media reports today include one home that has 17 out of 64 uh, residents that have passed away with coronavirus, that's over 25%, over one quarter of the residents that have passed away with coronavirus. You're the public health authority. What have you done, given that it's nothing in your minutes, to try and protect this sector? And then just given that you've mentioned, Olive, that the RQIA is taking, um, is undertaking visits, um, I have been informed by their chief executive around about a week ago that they weren't doing that, that they were simply making phone calls and offering advice. 
So can you let me know when you were aware that that change has moved and that there are actual inspections taking place? Thank you. Would you like me to answer this question now? Yes, so go ahead. I, I, yes, Please. Yes, so, yes, in relation to... The, we, we've been advised this week that our QIA um, uh, are inspecting. Our QIA are part of the Silver Command and report in here on a daily basis to us in relation to the care home sector. So that's where we got our information. Can, I might come in, sorry. And, you know, I obviously recognise that, um, that there are a significant number of frail, vulnerable patients in care homes, and this is a time of significant anxiety for those individuals and for their families, and that we have a societal duty to do all that we can to care for our elderly, you know, who have um, given to society over a, a lifetime. So I think there's a passionate concern about that within the public health agency um, and a recognition of the issue. There has been a recognition from very early on that care homes were going to be a significant uh, area in which the, there would be challenge and likely to be a significantly higher um, fatality rate than in other parts of society. Um, and the PHA, in conjunction with the Health and Social Care Board and the Trust, has developed a regional plan which has three main aims. The first is prevention, which is focused on tr testing, on uh, infection control training, enhanced cleaning, reduced footfall, and on-site uh, support for uh, infection control delivered through nurses and perhaps in due course through some dentists who interestingly are a group that have a very strong focus on infection control. The second strand of that regional plan is mitigation, which is about cohorting residents, that's keeping residents who are infected in uh, one part of the home and work with one part of staff. Um, and there is a virtual acute care support team which is reaching in through video linking, etc., into care homes to support them. And then the third strand of the plan is supporting care home continuity, which um, is focused on step up and step down alternatives and redeployment of trust staff into the uh, care homes where care homes are starting to, to struggle in, in one way or another. So I think there is a, a lot of that work is being coordinated by the Director of Nursing, the Director of Social Care, and the, and the Health Protection Team in close conjunction with RQIA. So there is that coordinated uh, regional response um, meeting on a regular basis. There is a, a meeting today with the infection control leads across the system as well. Um, I'm just trying to say that it's not that there isn't a problem. We recognize the problem. There is intensive work on the problem. Um, it is an ongoing problem and likely to be an ongoing problem for some time. Um, and it may be replicated in some ways in the future in other settings where one has a large number of people living uh, under the same roof. So in hospitals are a high risk area or um, houses of multiple occupation or sheltered uh, or accommodation, supported accommodation context as well. So these are contexts that we are keeping a, a close eye on. Okay, thank you. And could I ask the panel just to identify as you're coming in who it is, just because on the phone it can be hard to distinguish, um, and to, to, to keep the keep the, uh, the volume up as far as possible, please, Paula. Um, thank you, and thank you, panel. I'm not going to repeat the concerns raised by my um, committee colleagues, so I'll move on. But I, I am gravely concerned at, at the state of um, the support for our care homes. I'm, I'm actually going to look at your report on page nine. You talk about staff shortages and acute service pressures, and you talk about the fragility of the PHA health protection services. Could you please give us a comment on whether you feel that you have enough resources and you're equipped enough to actually deal with this issue? Hello, please. Thank you. Yes, so it's um, uh, Hugo here. Um, the PHA, I think, is well set up as a central body that pulls together um, a multidisciplinary team. Uh, there is, as I've said already, a director of nursing. We work closely with the director of social care in the health and social care board. Um, I think that no system across the world 
has had a health protection team that would be uh, sitting waiting to deal with a global pandemic. So every public health team in every country across the world has been stretched by uh, the pandemic. But uh, I think people have risen to the challenge. We have managed to bring in some individuals who are retired uh, to help us. We have reached out uh, with, to, to other sectors where there is resource. We are linking you know, on the voluntary sector side where that's appropriate. We're also using the contracts that we have around health improvement and health promotion and seeking to use the individuals uh, where we contract with those third sector organisations to focus their activity on helping society to respond to this huge challenge you know, across all the dimensions of that challenge. We've spoken before about the mental well-being, the emotional support, the, the wider societal needs, the, whether that's you know, getting your food delivered to your front door, etc. There is a huge response uh, going on across a whole range of dimensions, and I think that um, within the confines of what one would expect, I think we are uh, reasonably resourced. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I mean, obviously, car homes, um, there's a lot of concern, um, especially in, in recent days, and, and the people I've been speaking to, a lot of them feel let down. And to be frank, a lot of them feel that the PHA took their eye off the ball um, in regards to um, the coronavirus. Uh, I wanted to ask Olive, um, how many car homes has she visited since being um, appointed the chief executive of the PHA? Um, and also, um, what planning are you aware of uh, in car homes that took place in January and February, including any conversations with the chief medical officer? Okay, a panel, please. Okay, um, um, it's all of here. I have not uh, visited any care homes since I've come into the PH. Since I've come into the PHA, um, we are not an inspectorate body. The IA are the inspectorate body, um, and given and given the the uh, concerns about the transmission of infection, it would not have been wise for me to visit care homes. However, we have had a lot of communication with care home providers who have sought uh, advice and support from the PHA, but also myself because I have come from the RQIA. So we are all in this space helping and supporting them. So it would not have been appropriate for me to visit a care home. Um, your, the, the second part of your question was the preparedness. Yeah. Um, every nursing home has a business continuity plan and a winter preparation plan. Um, we re that was revisited with all the care homes last year, and there were workshops provided for homes to be prepared for, um, for winter, which includes respiratory um, um, outbreaks and the support. Because flu comes every year, and, uh, and flu can have a devastating effect on particularly on older people. So they, there are flu plans, there are winter preparation plans, there are business continuity plans, um, and they are all in place. Um, and in relation to the, the daily active management and close monitoring done by the PHA, that is done where an outbreak is declared to us. We manage it until it's finished, and we are satisfied that it is safe to reopen that home. Uh, with respect, all of um, a flu plan, is a lot different from having a, a plan to deal with a, a global pandemic, uh, a viral pandemic. It doesn't sound like there was, from your comments, uh, any plans in place from a public health agency's perspective to um, tackle current home um, infection rates. Okay, I'll, I'll pass to, to, to Hugo, who brings some expertise in this area. Yeah, I think that what you're highlighting is that close communication with care homes is really, really important for both um, the sense that they feel supported going through time, and also that they are given appropriate expert advice. Um, the PHA is in contact through a variety of means, phone calls, emails, uh, etc., with over a hundred uh, care homes uh, each day at the moment. So there is intensive input um, with the care homes, uh, through, you know, and and an open, uh, strong working relationship with them at both at the level of the managers of each care home and also the organisations that own care homes. 
Okay. Um, Alex? Yeah, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have to say I'm deeply concerned about the, what we're hearing about the news about figures and, and um, the nursing homes. Can you assure me that all related deaths with, uh, with COVID-19 and cases that are reported with residents that have it are being reported accurately on a daily basis and that those figures uh, marry up with the Department of Health and RQIA. And can you also just add on, could you tell us how many nursing homes across Northern Ireland have reported cases of the COVID-19? I think um, there's 484 nursing homes, so I'd like to know that figure, please. Thank you. Parallel, please. I'm happy to, I will, I will cover the, the figures and I'll ask Hugo to cover the case definitions. So um, today there are 110 open and active cases uh, been managed by the public health agency where, where there are reported respiratory illnesses. Um, 35 of those are suspected possible COVID and 75 are confirmed COVID. 16 care homes have had outbreaks concluded since the start of the pandemic. And since the 16th of March, there have been 126 acute respiratory outbreaks reported to the public health agency. In relation to the reporting of the deaths and the cases, I'll ask Hugo to, to cover the case definitions and what has been reported to. Yeah, so I just want to pick up, uh, it's Hugo here, uh, what Jackie said earlier on, that um, we are in a situation where we have uh, partly to rely on symptoms and we also do use testing, but the testing is not a panacea. Um, a negative test doesn't always mean that an individual doesn't have the disease because firstly, the way that the swab is taken at the back of the throat or up the nose is not easy to do, particularly if you think of um, an elderly person with some degree or maybe of dementia, uh, that test is extremely difficult to undertake practically. And then one is dependent on that having picked up some of the virus at the back of the throat, which again will vary from person to person. So I guess what I'm trying to say is um, our focus is on mapping the trend and working intensely with both the care homes that have not so far had an outbreak as well as the ones who have an outbreak because prevention is at least as important as working with care homes that have had it. So our focus is on having a reasonably accurate number rather than a precisely accurate number. Um, the symptoms in older people can be quite nuanced. You can have uh, an older person who just becomes a little bit confused or goes off their food or maybe has a little bit of a fall or maybe has some diarrhea. All those symptoms could be symptoms of COVID as well as the classical symptoms of a high temperature and cough, particularly uh, and shortness of breath, particularly in older folks. So we are trying to encourage care homes to have a low level of suspicion and to um, ask for an individual to be tested if, if they have concerns that there's a possibility that the person is unwell. Um, I, does that help to paint a little bit of a picture? It, it's a, we, we need to work both with the care homes that have infection, but in a sense, the ones where we're seeking to prevent infection moving into those care homes are, are equally important. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, go now to a further round of... No, sorry, I, I had said I would go to the phone there, so I'll go to... Uh, Pam and Arlea on the phone. Pam, are you there at the minute? I am, yes. Thank you, Chair. Yes, and um, thank the panel for uh, the presentation this morning. We understand it's a very difficult situation and we're all very, very concerned about our care homes in particular. Um, and, and I'm actually more concerned, you know, hearing, um, uh, you know, how difficult it is actually to even... Um, be suspicious of COVID-19 within older people. It, 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 it is quite obvious that it's, it is not a simple task and testing is also difficult and that's very much understood. 
Um, I suppose what I want to ask is around um, the PPE issue in the care homes, and we know that there the certainly was in the past um, difficulty in accessing PPE, and we hope that that is uh, now well under control. I would also be concerned that um, not only that, that there might not have been sufficient PPE within the care homes and for uh, since the beginning of the outbreaks, but also can you tell us if the um, if all the staff had and have received the full training required in proper use of PPE because we understand that it it can people can easily infect themselves and others if 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 whilst they maybe have the appropriate PPE, it's not um, put on correctly or taken off correctly. So could you uh, tell us a bit more about uh, the PPE? And I, I very much welcome the news that um, dentists and dental nurses are now being uh, involved in care homes. Can you tell us maybe a bit more about uh, what they're doing in the care homes now? Thank you. Over to panel, please. Thank you. It's Hugo here. Um, I think it's really important that we do touch on PPE. It is absolutely key to uh, keeping both the residents and the carers as safe as we possibly can in the context of this pandemic. Um, obviously, there's lots of different items of PPE and the, the basic PPE of gowns and, and gloves um, and, and the use of face masks in, in appropriate situations and um, so on. I think you're right in saying that that can be difficult for care homes to um, wade through large quantities of guidance that there is and be really clear on it. And so there has been a, a, an intense effort to try to provide access to information to care homes and the capacity to speak to individuals who have expertise that's relevant, and both within RQIA, the trusts and the public health agency so that, we, um, that any question that is arising can be answered. There have been instances in which care homes have not fully understood at particular times and have been on a learning curve around the use of PPE. Um, and I think that that's um, something that we continue to keep a close eye on, that we need to keep reinforcing the messages and keep uh, making sure that that training continues to be delivered. We. Um, our role is really to support the management and leadership of the care home in their own internal training. We we're happy to go in and do any training in any way that we possibly can. But we also have to respect the management of the care home as the management of the care home. Uh, so that, that's uh, a balance that I think we have good relationships with all the care homes. So that does make it easy. The supply of PPE, again, is through the trust. Uh, from central supplies. Um, again, I think that is working better than it has been at times. Again, some of that is just a communication issue, an understanding of who to ask and how to ask. There are clear single points of contact in each trust for care homes to make contact with. Uh, and again, if, if, if there were any problems with that, there are escalation routes as well. Okay, thank you. And Orlea on the phone. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thanks to the panel. Um, so, I mean, we've been told that the developments in testing have continued basically since the start of the pandemic. Um, and in the Rays paper, it was quote, quote that the, um, the, uh, these were stepped up, particularly through the month of April, due to increases in capacity. So, I was just wondering, can the PHA share? any documents detailing what those developments are dating back to January, maybe the first positive case in February, because I would be concerned that the testing strategy paper that the committee received from the Department of Health on the 6th of April, it didn't reference or map out any detailed plan for a wider community testing and contact tracing program. Um, and that paper also stated that the, the, the Department of Health testing strategy paper also stated that the current testing capacity was, quote, constrained. So, in your view, has the priority for testing and contact tracing in our care homes and, indeed, in the wider community, has this taken so long to, to evolve due to this lack of capacity? 
And could this not have been addressed or planned for at a much earlier stage of the pandemic? Thank you. Uh, brief while here. Can I answer the question on testing? Go ahead, Brief. Yes, of course. Okay. Um, our capacity for testing um, at the end of February was uh, roughly 40 tests per day. The testing capacity um, currently available to Northern Ireland this comes through two work streams. One is the testing capacity available through hospital laboratories, and that currently has, is now standing at 1,700 tests per day. And we also have, running in parallel, a national initiative, which is responsible for the drive-through centres in the SSE, the City of Derry Rugby Club, and Craig Avenue MOT. And that has a, a daily testing capacity of 750 tests per day. In terms of our plans going forward, we are hoping to further increase the testing capacity uh, in both our hospital laboratories and also through the national initiative. In our hospital laboratories, they are part of an academic consortium that includes the, that includes the uh, laboratories in AFI, ALMAC, and also Citric in the West. And we expect, as part of that, that we will be able, by the end of May, to increase our testing capacity by a further uh, 2,000 tests per day. The other development in the national initiative is we're hoping during the month of May that we will have two mobile units who will be able to assist in the management of outbreaks or areas where there's clusters of infection. And they will have a testing capacity, each mobile unit, of roughly two to 300 tests per day. So in a relatively short period of time, we've rapidly increased our testing capacity. In relation to the testing strategy document dated the 5th of April, that was at a point in time when our testing capacity in hospitals was extremely uh, restricted and very much focused on hospitalized patients. And the national initiative did not come on on stream until um, the beginning of April. So in a relatively short period of time, we have increased capacity, but it's also clear that we're now at a different stage in the pandemic than we were when the strategy was first issued. And I can advise that we're currently updating the strategy to reflect the developments in um, contact tracing, and the need to uh, undertake more surveillance now to get more information about what is circulating in the community. And uh, hopefully that uh, updated strategy will be available in the next seven to 10 days. Okay, thank you. Uh, going to Pat. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose I concur with some of the comments from previous speakers about the lack of preparation uh, for this pandemic and pandemic in terms of the havoc it was going to wreak in uh, residential care settings and in other health care settings. Uh, and I just wonder um, how many residents from care homes were referred to hospital since the first outbreak of this case? And just uh, secondly, uh, I have some information after speaking to staff in Muckamore Abbey Hospital that there's a serious situation there with up to 20 staff having tested positive for COVID-19 over the last week or 10 days, and that there's still free movement between wards uh, among members of staff. So this is another uh, uh, setting where there are very vulnerable patients, and I'm wondering what the PHA are going to do about that. Thank you. Panel, please. I think you know it's concerning to hear the the information that you have. I would certainly be concerned to hear about staff moving between uh, different wards. I think that um, every effort should be made to keep staff linked to the same set of patients, so that if some spread does happen in a group of patients or a group of staff that that is as ring-fenced as possible, and as you know well, the concept underpinning that is cohorting. So it is concerning to hear um, that you're hearing evidence of that not being followed, um, and 
you know, I think that we would want to try to do everything we could to support any specific context where that's happening with um, advice to make sure that they understand that that is very high risk. Um, there have been pressures on st on the number of staff available in some contexts because of people of staff self isolating or being unwell or having family members uh, for whom they have to be at home. So we do recognise that some contexts have been under huge pressure, and of course, as I'm sure you're aware, the risk is that when um, there's a reduced staffing quantum, the staff are under increased pressure and therefore the quality of infection control can slip. So that's why we are um, investing in, in terms from the regional tier, uh, supporting the hospitals in putting in increased cleaning and supporting with staff going into specific homes that uh, have problems of one sort or another or have staff shortages. We also have to be careful in doing that because if the staff that we put in um, work across different contexts, then they might be causes of spread as well. So I think there's this difficult balance between peripatetic staff who, 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 who wander around between different contexts and who can provide good advice uh, and limiting the, the contact between a group of patients and a group of staff. Um, uh, that would be my main focus in this context. What about the number of patients referred? Number of patients referred, Hugo, or, or any of the other panel? Um, I don't have that figure to hand. Um, we, we could try to get an estimate of it, um, but it would be dependent on us asking each trust for that information. So it might take a little bit while to, to get back to you on that one, but we can come back to you on that one. Okay, thank you. And Alan? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm just wondering if the PHA have identified uh, a common denominator of how the virus is actually getting in uh, to the homes. And uh, is it possible uh, to completely exclude on a continuing basis the virus from getting into the residential uh, home setting? And is it a difficulty that if you tested all the staff and all the residents of a particular home today and the results come back clear, that by the beginning of next week you could be facing an outbreak in that same home? Is, is that basically the case? Yeah, I think you're articulating it very well. The, the difficulty is that a negative test today doesn't mean, as you say, that a week later you won't have an outbreak in that home. And even if you tested every person and every member of staff every single day, um, it would tell you what was happening, but in and of itself, it wouldn't prevent um, an infection coming into home. And I think, as you're maybe alluding to, once an infection has got into a home, um, it is remarkably difficult to, to eradicate it, just because homes are built to be homely rather than built to be fortresses. Um, we, as you know, uh, visiting has been severely restricted and other measures have been put in place, but um, it is a balance in terms of locking every member of a resident in a home in solitary confinement, as it were, uh, 24 hours a day, and yet at the same time giving them a homely environment and a good quality of life and um, making them feel cared for and that there's, you know, contact with human beings. So um, I, I, just, I think you're pointing out it's a, a complex balance. Okay, thank you. Okay, panel, um, I'm now going uh, back to, we'll, we'll take a further round of questions. So, um, first of all, I would like to address the issue of, um, it sometimes feels like, like there's a conversation around easing, easing of lockdown measures I have observed myself where traffic is, is noticeably increasing. The very first mention within the, the World Health Organization guidelines that, that you referred to earlier, Jackie, states that COVID-19 transmission is controlled. And that would mean that, that the, those hugely traumatic individual death rates that we are seeing and that has such an impact on every family would be falling. And we are not seeing that. The other thing that we need to see is, is that the outbreak in high vulnerability settings are minimised. And from the conversation that we are after having, that clearly is not the case. 
So we are still very much here in the business of saving lives, and, and everything that, that is being discussed today is in that context. So my question to you is, what is, what is and, and I, I understand the bridge has set out a number of, of figures there, and those are, those are very welcome, but what is your assessment of the level of contact, of testing, contact tracing, that we would need to be at before we could start to consider easing lockdown restrictions? Yeah, panel, please. It's Hugo here. Um, I'll try and pick up on a couple of your comments. I think you're right in saying that we all noticed that the traffic on the roads has increased somewhat um, and, and, and recognise the, the potential uh, factors that might be associated with that. Um, you're raising the issue of um, what we do in relation to trying to protect um, the care home sector. And I think um, it would be. Can you articulate the question again? Well, for my, me? My, you need you need to be uh, in a position where risk in high vulnerability settings are mitigated. It's very clear from the conversation here that coronavirus is widespread within the care home sector. We're looking at 25% of this stage and potentially rising. So, would you agree with me that that? we need to be in a much different place before we consider easing lockdown restrictions and social the, 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 the working and all of that. What, what, what I'm asking you, Hugo, is how, mu how many tests would we need to be doing per day to be in a position to start lifting the restrictions? I don't think there's a close connection between the two. I think, so we had some modelling evidence from England which suggested that the growth in care homes that was happening in England was rising exponentially. That is doubling, you know, so you've got 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, that kind of type of growth in the care homes in England. And that, you know, meant that we have, as I say, developed this regional plan. We've had an intense focus. And I think as a result of that, we have not had exponential growth in the care homes affected in Northern Ireland. So I think we have done, uh, in terms of international actually remarkably well. That doesn't mean to say that we haven't got a rising number of affected care homes, but in terms of what one might have expected, I think we have done quite quite well. I think we should be careful about counting our chickens before they hatch, as it were, but I think we have done quite well in this space, really, in terms of the rate of rise, because we obviously monitor the rate of rise very carefully. Testing um, is now, you know, a very active policy within care homes, and I think that is important. I don't think there's any rate-limiting step in relation to care homes, in relation to testing. I thought Breed may want to comment on that aspect. Um, just to uh, reinforce what Hugo has said, if there's an outbreak in a care home, all staff and residents are tested. But why? What, do, do, you not, do you not believe that we need to be testing all care homes, given the vulnerability and the potential for every care home out there to become a, to become a, a, a site of further spread? What, what is the public health uh, position in terms of as to why we are not testing staff and residents in all care homes? Well, it's a very good question. It's one that we keep under constant review. Um, earlier, Hugo mentioned that um, you may have a negative result because either the test has been done too early or the test has been uh, incorrectly applied. And you need to be careful in asymptomatic people that over-reliance is put on testing and that a negative result gives a false reassurance, whereas in fact they are incubating the disease and will be positive in a couple of days. So our approach, which is kept under review, is that it's really important in homes that are currently have no COVID-19 cases, that they apply strict infection control procedures to reduce the likelihood of that happening. But as I said, we, we are keeping this under constant review. Um, there is another broader issue is that, um, you, you know, I mentioned there our testing capacity, and we would, you know, if we went to the stage where we offered testing to everyone, and we're not at that stage in any care home, we, we would only be able to do it you know, in a phased cyclical way, and I'm not sure the effectiveness of that uh, has been established, and I'm not sure it will give us the, um, the impact that we might, might expect it to do. 
Okay, and, and, and that, will that will continue to be an issue we'll come back to. But the other part of my question was, and um, just to clarify, at what level do public health agencies believe we need to be case finding and testing in the community, the mass community testing? Where do you think we need to be in relation to that in order to safely start easing lockdown? Jackie here, um, um, that's a good point because it underpins an awful lot of what we're going to do going forward. Now, at the moment, from the, the few um, areas we've actually done the contact tracing as part of the pilot, we're finding for every case that's come reported to us as positive, and some of them have been asymptomatic people who've been in care homes, okay, and they, they may be positive because they previously had infection and they're just releasing some of that dead material up through their lungs, so when they get tested, they may not be infectious, but they might get a positive result. So there's a little bit of complication in there. Um, but it's very important because the few that we have actually done just to test the system have demonstrated that the contacts that they have are very, very few. And that's incredibly important and very, very helpful because that means that people in the community have been following the guidance not to go around and mix with others. So when they become ill with it, they're only possibly passing it on to one other in the same household. Hopefully, they don't pass it on to anybody because as soon as they feel unwell, then they self-isolate from other members of the household. Now, when we get to that stage and continue to see that, we'll get one person passing to less than one, and that's what we know is good to ease the, the, social, dis the, ease the social distancing. But easing the social distancing doesn't mean we change anything we have advised so far. That has to come with a maintenance of the two-metre distance between people. They mustn't spend more than 15 minutes within two metres without any sort of protection. And so that's out in the public and also in care homes. So the key thing that we're finding in terms of the care homes is that it may have got in there once, but people are still coming in and out into the community. And as soon as we get community infection down, then we will see the impact in the care homes. It's also fair to say that we, you know, that the decisions about lockdown are a policy matter that, as the PHA, we would not be in a position to comment on. But the, the R number, the reproductive number, is believed to be uh, below one, so that you know we are in a good position in terms of where we are in Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, I think that there are lessons to draw from across Europe in terms of the approaches that are being taken. Our evidence is being considered. There is a scientific advisory group which reports to the chief medical officer um, and gives him advice. Hugo, sorry, sorry for interrupting you there, Hugo. Um, you said there that, that that's a policy, policy decision that is not your role to comment in, but surely th that policy should be informed by your expertise for, for the purposes of our population here. So I repeat my question, how many t what level of testing do we need to be at? And, and when I say testing, I include the case finding and, and, and the, uh, the tracing. So what level of testing do we need to be at? I wouldn't base it on testing, to be honest with you. I think it's more about the, community, the evidence around community transmission, the, the key metrics that are looked at in terms of most international situations are the rate of admissions to hospital, the, num the number of people in intensive care, um, stud small studies that are done. So we have done small studies in care homes, for example, to see how many people are infected in care homes. Um, some, so it's, it's what I'm trying to say is one uses a triangulation approach, that is to use multiple uh, metrics to assess where we are in this wave of the pandemic. I think it is fair to say that most international contexts recognise that it is not impossible that there will be a second or third wave of the pandemic. We may have to live with COVID-19 for many years. Uh, and develop mechanisms that allow us to, to do that. The, the UK government did outline five tests for, for lifting the lockdown, um, but making sure the NHS can cope, uh, a sustained and consistent fall in the daily death rate, the rate of infection decreasing to manageable levels, ensuring a supply of tests and PPE can be met, can meet future demand, and being confident that any adjustment would not risk a second peak. Um, so, and different jurisdictions have come up with similar testing, cri similar criteria, but I think the interesting thing about them all is that none of them are relying on one single criteria. It is an opinion, I think, at the end of the day, based on looking at a range of factors, at the risks, um, and at the mitigation that can be put in place. So 
as Jackie has been talking about, she's leading on this approach to contact tracing, which allows us to both continue to keep a downward lid on the reproductive number in the community and also to monitor um, the situation as we move forward. The other thing that will be key to monitoring going forward is antibody testing uh, of samples of the population. Um, so we, that, that antibody tests are only just beginning to appear on the market and have approval. And the academic group uh, has, had, has plans to undertake surveillance using antibody testing that in, will inform the picture of what is happening societally. So I think we have um, a strong infrastructure which is tightly collaborating with the Republic of Ireland and other jurisdictions to be in a position to monitor as steps are taken to um, ease the restrictions and to do that in a dynamic way. So I, I feel quite confident that the infrastructure is there to closely monitor that. Okay, I'm going, I'm going to move on for now. You will be aware, and you all will be aware, of the contact tracing for COVID-19 current evidence document released by the uh, European Centre for Disease Control. Within that, it says, for countries that have enforced strict physical distancing measures to interrupt the chains of transmission, which is what we have been doing, case-finding measures, including contact tracing, are, contact tracing, testing and isolating, are a key priority once the physical distancing measures are lifted. Uh, to reduce the risk of further disease escalation. Now, I have seen, I have seen and, and, and I know members have detailed questions, I'm coming on to members now soon, but one thing I haven't seen or heard of is the arrangements that have been made around isolating, because the purpose of testing, testing and tracing is to identify who needs to be isolated. So I want to know what arrangements have been made for isolating people who may need it, and that includes people travelling into the country, but also I'm very concerned, and I mentioned this to you the last time you were in front of the committee, was the issue of a lot of the foreign national communities here who are working in uh, quite congregated settings, living in high multi multiple occupancy housing, and who may find it difficult to apply the isolation that is required. So what supports and what recommendations are public health making in relation to the isolation part of this strategy? So I, I think you're raising an important point. There are situations in which individuals may have personal circumstances that make their uh, self-isolation difficult. That issue has been recognised and there has been a, a number of contexts in which that has been considered. One context that came up quite early on was fishermen uh, and steps were put in place to identify contexts where individuals could be housed uh, while the, they required, for example, for 14 days to self-isolate. A number of groups, including the ones that you've mentioned, where that uh, possibility arises, and there are there is provision in a variety of settings across Northern Ireland where that provision can be made. Is there adequate provision, Kugel? Is that is that already in place? Yes, it is. Plenty, there's plenty of provision. It, there's been no way at all that that provision has been stretched. And what's your assessment of how, how many of those places will be required? I think that the numbers are likely to be relatively small, um, but you know I think it is an important uh, consideration that we can provide support to any individual who needs it. Okay, I'm going to go to members now. I'll, I'll go to the phone first, and then I have Jerry indicating. But I'll go back to the phone. Uh, uh, I'll take Orlea, or I'll take Pam, and then Orlea on the phone, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Pam, again. Um, I suppose I've uh, two kind of parts to your question, and it's around um, PHA and and messaging and where you're going with that. And it has been mentioned to me that you know somewhere in amongst all that's going on, the message of self-isolating if you have a symptom is getting lost. So that's a, a, just a part of it. And um, I also wanted to ask you, in relation, I've been contacted by NHS Heart and Stroke, and they're saying that the statistics are suggesting that we have had eight non-COVID excess deaths every day for the last four weeks. So uh, our PHA, and uh, that this is the call, I suppose, is that the PHA should be running a fast campaign in order to highlight that, because we, we don't want people 
you know, dying with COVID, nor do we want people dying because they're not accessing um, the services that, that they need to access. Thank, thank you, Pam. Uh, panel, please. Uh, Bridge here. Can I answer that question? Yeah, Bridge, go ahead. Um, yeah, we are aware that um, that people have been reluctant to seek care, and and we have seen a slight reduction in our numbers of people who receive thrombolysis or clot busters for stroke. Um, but but it's, it's very encouraging to note that the number of thrombectomies in Northern Ireland, um, which is where, you, uh, where you're transferred to Belfast and have the clot retrieved by an interventional neuroradiologist, that the numbers actually increased during the pandemic, which is really uh, good to see because it suggests that the expert assessment has been undertaken when people did present to hospitals. But it is of concern, and we have been talking to our communications people, and we are going to run fast on a, our social media platforms first. And we're also looking at getting posters put into public venues, uh, including GP surgeries, um, supermarkets, and other areas, as, 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 as just to get people back and, and responding to the fast message, because it's an incredible part of the message for the general public and easily understood, and people act appropriately when they when they see the, the four signs. So um, we're aware of the issue and we are going to do some more um, media on social, more publicity on social media and we'll keep it under review. Okay, that's, thanks. That's, Chair, can I just come back there a second? Yeah, go ahead, Pam. Yeah, just to say that's, that's very welcome, thank you. Um, but in, in terms of then the self-isolating message, if you have a symptom for COVID-19, are you asking that question in relation to stroke? In relation no, to self-isolating for COVID, uh, what, what is the public yeah. health doing in terms, of, in terms of public messaging around the need for people to self-isolate where they're symptomatic? Oh, okay, I, I, I'll hand that one over to the, another member of the panel. Well, I think um, it's, it's always helpful to get feedback and to hear if you are recognising that you feel that that message is not getting out as well as it should. We take that on board. We are committed to continuing to put that message out uh, loud and clearly. So thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, or Leah, and can I just remind members that we're taking one question in this section and we'll, uh, just ask in light of time moving on if, if we can keep the questions fairly succinct and the answers fairly succinct and direct also, please. Thank you. Or Leah? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it mine is actually following on from um, some of the points that Pam had raised around the public messaging. Um, so similar to obviously the, the feedback that we had in relation to the excess deaths, um, non-COVID related, um, I've also been picking up the same concerns right across the mental health sector um, that, uh, you know, admissions are also down, um, you know, crisis admissions at EDs, um, also the contact through the community and voluntary groups, they've seen a reduction in their calls. So there, there is there is um, a real worry that, that people are at home, obviously still battling with mental health problems, but that aren't availing of the services that are still there for them. So if you could maybe just factor um, that in. And one other thing, there's also um, growing concerns uh, emerging around the increased um, consumption of alcohol. And I'm just really worried that whenever we come out of um, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, obviously, we're going to be dealing with a lot of men men mental health problems, um, and with obviously with increases on the amounts of alcohol that people might be um, might be consuming, this is going to be an additional um, problem and pressure for the health service. So, in any public campaigns that you're doing, um, it would be great if you could factor that in as well. Okay, thank you, Orlea. Um, has the panel noted those both those concerns? I think rather than respond, can you note and 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 uh, uh, are you aware of those concerns, Paul? Yes, yeah, so, and I think it's helpful to have them reiterated and as we are being asked to factor them in, we, we take that message on board. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. And following on from one of your points, I mean, the World Health Organization, the panel may be aware, have six requirements um, that have to be in place before lockdown should be lifted. There's nine at the time for the public health agency as key, influence, key influencers of public health to go on the offensive to demand that no lifting should be considered of the lockdown until those six requirements uh, are met. And if not, why not? Panel, please. 
I think that, um, as you're pointing out, there's no single requirement on which one could say, on this single factor, we would lift the lockdown. Um, we have a number of metrics that this needs to be measured on. Um, I think one should look at the European picture as well and the international evidence, as well as looking at Northern Ireland evidence as well in relation to this. Uh, and then I think it's a, a matter of the scientific advice being provided to, um, you know, through the appropriate channel and a policy decision being made. But um, it, it's trying to trade off individuals who, who have COVID or may have COVID, the economic kind of factors for society, the social factors we were, as we were healing, hearing earlier on, the mental health factors. There are a large number of factors to, to take into consideration. And I think inevitably there will be a variety of opinions as in this different individuals coming together. And a number of factors always come together slightly differently uh, around any situation such as that. And um, a consensus position really needs to be, to be reached. And with respect, I didn't get an answer to my question. Do you want to clarify the component you want me to answer? Yeah, specifically? please, yeah. I say it is now not the time for the public health agency, as key influencers of public health policy, to go on the offensive to demand no lifting of the lockdown should be considered until six of those World Health Organization guidelines are met. Um, I, I, my own personal view is that um, a significant proportion of those requirements, obviously I do look at the data every day, are moving in the right direction. Um, so certainly the data that I'm looking at has provided me with a degree of reassurance that, um, that the direction of travel is consistent with what we see happening uh, at a, an international level uh, around us. And um, I think that the trend continues to be in that direction, although obviously it needs to be closely monitored. OK, I'm going to go now to Pat. OK, thank you. Um, I suppose the, the importance of testing and tracing has been highlighted here this morning. And Olive, I just wanted you, uh, before we move on to my question, to clarify some remarks you made the last time you spoke to the committee on the 16th of April, that you said there were 500 people who were currently being trained uh, for contact tracing. Uh, how's that training going? Paula, please. Yes, yes, Pat, for clarity, we, we estimate that we will need to, to identify 500 people uh, to sorry, be trained. Sorry, Olive, sorry for interrupting you. No, yeah. you said on the 16th of April, and I'm going to quote to you, uh, Sorry, we have just described to you that we have recruited 500 people who are currently being trained. The chairperson then asked you for testing. Ms. McLeod then answered, yes, for testing. The chairperson came back in and said, I'm asking about contact tracing. And you then said, yes, this is contact tracing. So are you now saying, there weren't 500 people recruited, and there weren't 500 people being trained on April the 16th when you told us that. I, 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 yes, thank you for that, Pat. I don't have the record in front of me, but I do. What, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, what, what we're saying in relation to contract tracing, the environmental health officers were going could make. 400 people available to us, and they have the skills for, con for the contact tracing. But that's not what in you said, Olive. You said you had recruited 500 people who were currently well, then, being trained. Then, Pat, I, mis I, I, I spoke out of turn. That is incorrect. OK. O I, I, okay. I, if you spoke I, out of I, turn, that's fair enough. Now, I want to move on to my, my question. Uh, the decision was taken to end community tracing, uh, or sorry, contact tracing on the 12th of March, community testing and contact tracing. Uh, 
That decision, I presume, was relayed to the PHA from the department because it was the PHA who were responsible for contact tracing up to that point. What discussions took place with the department around the ending of contact tracing? Did you raise, did the PHA raise any objections? Uh, did you raise the fact that the World Health Organization were advising on the need for community testing and contact tracing? Thank you. Harold, please. Hi, Jackie here. I can answer that one, if it's okay. Um, yes, yeah. uh, the discussions have been held not just with the Department of Health, but um, across uh, the UK in terms of where we were with the contact tracing. Um, as I described, you need several criteria to contact trace. You need to know in, if somebody's got a temperature, if they've got breathlessness or a cough. But also the thing we're working on was the origin of their passage. Had they come from Wuhan or China or um, Germany, Italy or Austria? Um, it became so big, the people who were potentially carrying it, that it no longer became possible in our and many other countries to apply that more a non-test approach because we didn't have the testing. So at that point, there was widespread discussion about the best way to approach this. Um, and on that basis, the only way, if we do this in, in normal health protection practice, is to close the area to stop any further spread. And in the case of COVID, because it was such widespread, you end up with complete lockdown. So as I said, that's a very crude measure of doing this. In other areas, we could have tested people to get the diagnosis at that point in time. It would have been a little bit less of a lockdown, but nowhere had that level of testing available. So at that point in time, the safest thing to do was the final stage in health protection outbreak management, which Jackie, is to stop... Sorry, Jackie, could I interrupt you? I suppose I'm asking you, you know, why did contact tracing stop? What was the rationale for the stopping of contact tracing? Yeah, the rationale was... The rationale was is the fact that so many people fit the definition that it was no longer possible to find those people because it was everybody. Okay, so it was a capacity yeah. issue? No, it was the fact that we no longer had a definition that we could follow to contact everybody because we got calls from everybody about a temperature and a cough, and that is practically everybody in the population because you no longer had the country destination applied to it because so many people had moved around that we only had a cough and a temperature to go on and everybody had a cough or a temperature but because you're, it was when you're, you're aware you're aware surely jackie that the who and the ecdc advised to continue contact tracing even where there is widespread transmission of the disease that that's the way to uh, find out where it is uh, isolate it uh, and continue that's the fight that's right they advise testing with contact tracing Okay, to find out where it is, you can't just look at people with a temperature and a cough. They need to have the test, because otherwise it's everybody who's got asthma, who's got chronic bronchitis, who's got um, um, a winter cold. So it's very difficult to tell. So what you have to do at that point is break the chain of connection. So contact tracing stopped to break that chain of connection. And what we had to do at that point in time, we moved to messaging, public messaging, to do that, to break the chain of connection. And once we broke that chain and we're seeing the numbers dramatically decrease because that has been fairly successful at stopping the spread, now we need to reintroduce it because we've had what's equivalent to a fire sweeping through the place, devastating everything. We have to stop with everybody indoors and then when we go back out, we have to put out the little fires as they arise. So that's the approach we are now taking. Does that answer your question, okay. we'll, we'll have to come back to this because we want to move on to other members, but I think there are... There are remaining questions around that whole issue, the decision making, who was taking advice. We hear regularly about, about discussions taking place across Britain, but what we as a committee are interested in is what steps were being taken to recognise the unique circumstances we had here. We have a devolved Department of Health here which can take its own decisions, but anyway, we'll, that's going to continue to be an issue, I think, for the committee. Um, I now have Paula. Um, thank you, Chair. This question is for all of it. It's non-COVID-19 non related. It's, the SNIS statistics have shown that there's been a rise over the last five weeks um, in terms of average number of deaths, and it's showing that there will be around eight per day. Um, I'm wondering what you're doing around the public health messaging. Obviously, a lot of these will be stroke, heart disease, heart attacks, and um, issues that people should be presenting at emergency departments and GPs. It is your responsibility to get those public health messages out 
and I think they're being drowned out in, in the midst of all the other conversation about COVID-19. So, how are you planning to remedy this? Thank you for that question. We have a very active communication and engagement plan, um, and we have rolling messages on a daily basis in relation to all of the issues that we have just covered from, from maintaining good mental health to alcohol control to uh, people specifically with diabetes for women who are pregnant. That program is rolling out and those messages are being issued on a daily basis. We are using all the platforms available to us, all the media available to us from Twitter to, the, to newspapers to the television to get those messages out. We are also using all our community uh, contacts and, and programs that we uh, commission to make sure that people are getting the message out to keep themselves healthy through the GPs to make sure that if you are well or unwell that you do attend your GP, you do contact. Because it is very apparent from the, the numbers that we monitor on a daily basis that, that, that people were not attending their GP surgery, were not going to hospital. We are beginning to see those numbers climb again. People are getting the message that they need to look after their own health. And we, uh, in the public health, in relation to our messaging, will continue to uh, push those messages out. And uh, we, we will also be doing some sensitivity analysis on our messaging work. So we are looking at the hits on our website to make sure that the messaging is effective. Can I just come back? I, I think that this will require a degree of creativity because a lot of the people who need to receive these messages aren't necessarily on social media all day and looking at your website. I think that you need to be more involved in terms of getting the GPs to be proactive in that. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done around that. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Colin? Thank you very much, Chair, and to the panel, I make no apology for coming back to the issue of the care homes. I mean, we do have this uh, global pandemic, which in locally is in places killing up to 25% of people in homes. Um, we've identified through our conversations today that it's not mentioned in recent board meetings in the midst of the pandemic. I I'm getting conflicting messages. It feels like in some of the responses you're supporting testing, and then in some of your responses, you're suggesting that testing doesn't really achieve too much. <clears throat> you mentioned a three-point plan at one point for homes, two of which was one was washing your hands and the other was keeping people out. There's been ambiguity in your remarks about whether there are or not inspections into care homes and when they've started. Somebody mentioned that it's the role to map trends, which is very much a retrospective piece of work to, to map trends rather than something proactive. Um, and then you made the remark that the Public Health Agency doesn't comment on whether we should have locked down or not. So I'm still very concerned about the work that you're actually undertaking. But in regard to the homes, um, are you aware, is there any correlation between homes that would be on, for example, an RQIA or any other authorities at risk register that needs to have an extra eye kept on them, extra inspections on? Is there any connection between those on that list and the outbreaks within the homes uh, and indeed the deaths? Panel, please. I think what you're pointing out is the importance, as you go here, uh, of um, close working with the RQIA. Uh, so the trust will have a view uh, from their infection control perspective uh, when they're going into a home as to whether they have concerns. RQIA at times will have concerns about particular homes. And the health protection team will, um, you know, from post calls and contacts, have concerns at the time. There is an infection and control uh, group which is chaired by the nurse director, which has the overarching uh, role of looking at infection control and prevention and uh, seeking to develop and approaches to reducing that. I mentioned things like increased cleaning in care homes because a lot of the way that the virus is spread is through surfaces that become contaminated. You know, somebody coughs on their hand and then puts their hand on a desk or something and then somebody else touches that desk in, in the next few hours and then touches their face. So that kind of breaking the chain of communication of a virus through a cleaning is particularly important as well. And I think it's important that uh, we emphasize that there is close working relationship between the trust, RQA, 
and the Public Health Agency to share information that uh, around care homes. We have to find a fine balance between not stigmatising homes that have an outbreak. There have been instances in the past where homes have been stigmatised and staff have been inappropriately stigmatised when there has been an outbreak in a home. And I think it's important that we avoid that while at the same time having an intense focus, as you said, on which are the priority homes where we need to put um, a focus. And I think you would therefore understand a sensitivity at times about putting all that in the public domain because we want to be there to support homes, to uh, be rigorous in our um, questioning of how well they're doing, but also being supportive and um, coming alongside them, recognising that they are facing an unprecedented challenge that they've never faced before uh, and that their staff are doing an amazing job. The individual stories that I'm sure you've heard as well from carers and care homes are of real compassion, self-sacrifice, uh, and I think we, you know, I think you would agree with me, we owe a debt of gratitude to these staff. Chair, once again, it's a fantastic answer to a question, just not the one that was asked. And if I can press again, are you aware, is there a connection between homes that are identified as being at risk and those that actually have the outbreaks and the deaths? Okay, I will answer that for you. It's all of here. In relation to homes that had enforcement, um, as we went into the pandemic, I think there was a, a one or two homes that were under enforcement and that enforcement has been lifted. So in relation to a correlation between homes that have enforcement and outbreaks, w w there is nothing evident to us. But what we have done is we have worked, as Hugo has said, very carefully. Each trust has a granular plan in relation to every home in their area and how they will support them to either uh, deal with the outbreak or keep the outbreak um, out of the home. Hugo has said infection prevention and control is key to this. So training has been supported and increased for all homes. It's you know, classroom-based and video-based and support from infection control nurses. Um, there has been investment, we understand, that will go into each home for extra cleaning to, to try and dampen down any outbreaks that are happening. So I think in relation to the role of the, the, the public health agency and the funding for the homes to increase their PPE, because normally homes would have a fairly basic PPE, which would be aprons and gloves. That has been increased to gowns, to masks, to fluid shield masks. So that investment has gone into the homes, the investment for extra cleaning and the investment of staff from the trust to go into the homes to provide the care, particularly for end of life care, to make sure that patients are getting what they deserve. The GPs have worked with us. Okay, Oliver, thank, thank you. Everybody has oxygen and medication. Olive, Olive, th thank you. Um, yeah, I think, I think there, there, there may be a number of outstanding questions which we're not going to get at today, but members, I think, can, can, uh, will we'll, we'll possibly want to put further additional questions to you in writing um, in relation to some of the, the questions around uh, th those linkages. Um, yes, Alan. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, just, uh, I would ask the, uh, the panel if we could maybe help me understand, uh, has this drive to re-establish contact tracing come about as a result of outside pressures, or is it a strategic response been driven as part of a current scientific and appropriate tactic at this particular stage of the crisis? Thank you, panel. Jackie, it is absolutely normal health protection outbreak response. Once you close something down, at some point you've got to reopen it. And when you reopen it, you've got to make sure that little pockets of infection don't arise and start this whole thing going again. So it's very standard uh, operational processes. So whenever it went to the lockdown and we saw the lockdown beginning to work, very early on in the first three weeks of lockdown, you're starting to think ahead and think, what happens next? How do we get out of this? How do we get people back into circulating? And so when they go back into circulating, the disease has not gone. We have not got treatment. We have not got vaccine. So there is a risk to people. So we have to maintain the distancing, but we also must clamp down very quickly on any little clusters where people have not or will not obey these sort of regulations of two-meter distancing um, or, or not doing so without protection. 
So it's very important it was always part of the process and always considered to be part of outbreak, normal outbreak management. There was no pressure, there was no strategic planning, it's part and policy of what we do in health protection. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, a, final, a final question from me then in relation to um, the, the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy have written to the Minister raising the issue of PPE for therapists conducting dysphagia assessment. Now, bear in mind that the European guidance states that the disease is mainly spread from person to person through inhalation of respiratory droplets from an infected individual, cough or sneeze. Um, so, can you advise if that will now be accepted as an aerosol generating procedure requiring PPE, um, which is, I think is, is rated as red? So can you advise on that issue? Um, thank you. It's Hugo here. Uh, we are aware of um, concerns from speech and language therapy, but we will need to, I think, defer to the chair of the Infection Control and Prevention Group in relation to that specific question, if that's okay, and come back to you on it. it is um, there needs to be a consensus around what aerosol entry procedures are and the guidance. There have been a number of situations in which different professional bodies have expressed concern and then there's been a negotiated process to, to reach a consensus around a position. And I think you're alluding to one of the contexts where that is an ongoing uh, negotiated, uh, you know, needing to negotiate to an agreed position. And given that this is actively happening as we speak, can, can we be assured that that will be done at some considerable pace to protect staff? Yeah, my, my understanding is that it is under active consideration. Thank you. Uh, I will, as I say, defer to the chair of the um, Infection Control and Prevention Group, who is the nurse director here, and, and ask for that individual to provide a specific response to that question. Thank you. Okay, um, panel, we'll, we'll leave it there. I'm sure we'll be in, in, future, in future discussions as this, uh, as this rolls on. Um, thank you for your presentations today and for your answers. Um, and I wish you luck in the, in the time ahead. All the best now. Okay, members, I'm going to propose that we take a short break there in order to get the, the next presentation onto the line. So could we come back, say, at quarter to 12? Thank you. Sure. Okay, our meeting is now restarted, and thank you, members, and thank you to our panel. In terms of our ongoing work in uh, around COVID-19 disease response, we are now going to receive a briefing from the British Association of Social Workers, NI. Can I remind members that representatives of BASWA are here today via teleconference to discuss issues affecting social work during the COVID-19 crisis? I refer members to tab six of your table papers. And I would now like to welcome Ms. Carolyn Ewart, National Director, and Mr. Andy McLennan, Communications and Public Affairs Officer. Thank you for joining us this morning, and I would now like to invite you to go ahead and brief the committee. Hello, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee on issues affecting the social work profession during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll begin by commenting on the scope of the Children's Social Care Coronavirus Temporary Modification of Children's Social Care Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. I will then address the wider issues for social workers as they continue to support some of the most vulnerable people in our society during lockdown. Banswa Northern Ireland welcomes the opportunity to comment on regulations and associated guidance documents and we have had a discussion with Department of Health officials concerning both. It is my understanding that the papers presented to committee on the 23rd of April have been updated, and the following comments refer to the version of the Department's guidance shared with Basel Northern Ireland on the 3rd of May 2020. We are broadly supportive of the proposals and recognise the need for greater flexibility for statutory children's services during the pandemic. However, at a time when many children will be at greater risk due to the absence of schools, sports clubs, daycare facilities, church and other supports, and indeed wider family networks, the need for support and vigilance is vital. Banff and Northern Ireland notes that the Department's revised version of the regulations have drawn back some timescales, and we welcome the clear statements included in the guidance documents that if capacity 
capacity allows, normal standards should be maintained. We therefore support the proposals that contact with children, families and carers should remain at pre-COVID-19 levels and that decisions to reduce or increase must be based on a robust interagency risk assessment. Fast in Northern Ireland has been calling for profession-specific guidance since before the lockdown was announced and therefore welcomes the accountability and support these regulations give to practising social workers. Turning to some specific sections in the regulations, in terms of social work services contact with children and young people during lockdown, FASA Northern Ireland is pleased to note that texting a young person as the sole means of contact has been addressed and the department considers texting as a supplemental means of contact only. In certain circumstances, we recognise that texting is entirely appropriate and at times many young people prefer it, but Basel and Northern Ireland would not support it as a sole means of communication. We also note that not every child and family has access to a computer or a tablet and stable Wi-Fi, and we support the proposal that in such cases, HSC trusts must supply such equipment to support remote contact. If it cannot, then home visits must be carried out in accordance with the care plan. And in such cases, social workers must have access to PPE. We recognise the proposed changes to fast-track new foster carers are a way to expand capacity at a time of increased need. We note that the fast-track barred list check will be supplemented by a full enhanced disclosure check and it is reliant upon Access NI continuing to process applications within normal timescales. However, if that situation were to change due to capacity issues within Access NI, urgent action would be required to review this measure. As we understand, many looked after uh, children reviews have been stood down in the past seven weeks, and our members note that clear operational guidance will be required to reassure staff that the lack of reviews that were stood down due to COVID-19 are not simply put into a backlog. It is Basel Northern Ireland's view that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to clear such a backlog going forward in the next three to six months. We also welcome the strengthening of the section on supports to care leavers, and we have been assured that no care leaver will be disadvantaged or face the loss of services as a result of changes to regulations. Timeframes for review of pathway plans can increase from six to nine months, but we note that this is a guide and not a target. As throughout, all decisions to vary the frequency of contact or reviews will be based on dynamic risk assessment. The regulations have been revised in relation to secure accommodation applications, given that the courts continue to hear such applications, and so normal timeframes for these have been maintained. FASMA Northern Ireland supports the tight six-month time limit for the regulations, given that these are significant changes. However, because we know the time frame for the surge in demand for social work services will differ to the acute stage, so when the curve flattens for hospital admissions and deaths, the focus will need to shift to the community response. It is therefore essential the Department prepares new proposals which set out the specific social work response and recovery plan for six and 12 months ahead. And Basel Northern Ireland would welcome the opportunity to work collaboratively on these plans. Lastly, in relation to this section, the draft regulations make multiple references to existing legislation being amended in line with guidance issued by the Department. Following approval of the statutory rule and the associated guidance, Basel Northern Ireland believes it is essential the Committee for Health is appraised of any subsequent amendments to the guidance during the six months the modifications are in place. I'll now move on to the issue of service delivery during the pandemic. During the period of lockdown, the vast majority of engagement with service users has been conducted via telephone and video call services. However, home visits continue in a relatively small number of high-risk cases, primarily for child safeguarding and mental health assessments. From the outset, Basel Northern Ireland has called for practice guidance for social workers, and whilst guidance has been uh, since been published by the Department of Health 
uh, on issues including residential children's homes, foster care and domiciliary care. Regrettably, no guidance has been provided in relation to social work home visits during the pandemic. At the beginning of the outbreak, there was widespread concern among social workers at the lack of availability of PPE for those continuing to undertake home visits. The issue was raised with the Health Minister on the 8th of April by ourselves, and our letter was, I believe, shared with the committee. In it, we highlighted the shortcomings in the Public Health England guidance on the use of PPE and called for provision of guidance on the use of PPE in social work-specific scenarios. By mid-April, there appeared to be a fragmented approach uh, to the use of PPE, and in the absence of regional guidance, each HSC trust was taking its own approach, leading to some variation. Basel Northern Ireland was informed by members of cases in which PPE was not available or where insufficient amounts of PPE were preventing changes of equipment between visits. The explanation provided to this committee by the Public Health Agency on the 16th of April concerning guidance on use of PPE by social workers was helpful in clarifying the HSC position. Significant unease had resulted from the Chief Social Worker statement to the committee on the 9th of April that for much of social work activity, it is not a requirement that staff use PPE. In the relatively small number of high-risk cases where visits continue, it is Basel Northern Ireland's view that a risk assessment of the scenario and the reality that maintaining social distancing will be beyond the control of the social worker would mandate the use of PPE in most, if not all, instances. Fortunately, recent reports from members indicate PPE is now available as required for social workers undertaking home visits. I now comment on some anticipated impacts for social work in the coming months. Understandably, since the outbreak, much of the public discourse has centred on the impacts on the health service. While necessary steps have been taken to ensure social work services continue to meet need at this time, it is expected that the impacts for social work will follow in a series of surges over the coming months and potentially years ahead. The recently reported decrease in referrals to children's services does not reflect the level of need. Rather, it is a result of many usual sources of referral simply not being in place to pick up children who need additional support or safeguards. Increased reporting of domestic abuse incidents and four domestic homicides since the beginning of lockdown highlighted growth in domestic violence associated with lockdown. It is expected rates of child abuse and neglect will also increase during this period and lead to a spike in referrals post-lockdown. The mental health impacts resulting from the pandemic, with many individuals living in isolation for a long, prolonged period, are yet to be quantified. However, as a post-conflict society, we know of the significant psychological impacts associated with social upheaval and the long-term mental health impacts when individuals don't have access to adequate support. Mental health social work services should plan for and significant investment should be allocated to address an increase in rates of anxiety and depression associated with the lockdown, as well as a growth in mental health problems among individuals hospitalised or bereaved as a result of the coronavirus. It has been established that economic deprivation has a major impact on mortality rates associated with COVID-19. However, looking ahead, any long-term economic downturn and associated growth in poverty can be expected to lead to an increase in demand for social work services, particularly children's services. There is a clear link between a family's socio-economic circumstances and the chances that their children will experience neglect or abuse. A growth in poverty will also be likely to worsen the mental health crisis According to 2018 figures, Northern Ireland had the highest suicide rate in the UK. Again, poverty is a key factor. Incidents of suicide are disproportionately represented in the most deprived areas of Northern Ireland. Protecting staff and service users from COVID-19 is essential. And we note that current capacity, whilst not yet at crisis point within social work, is fluctuating. 
We have some information indicating sickness levels across the HSC trusts and even across services within trusts is vastly different. This, added to wholly inadequate pre-coronavirus staffing levels, means that the system has little to no flex. Efforts to meet demands will be made by a social work workforce with a worryingly high vacancy rate. Department of Health statistics published in February 2020 indicate 366 social work posts, as 9% of all HSC social work posts were vacant. I appreciate this has been a significant amount of information, uh, and I would therefore welcome questions to explore any of these issues in more detail. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Caroline, for that. And I suppose before we start, I need to declare my own interest in this particular briefing in that I have previously worked as a social worker, um, currently on, on leave of absence. But um, just to say that it's a, it's a job that I enjoyed tremendously. And I also want to welcome, on behalf of the committee, all of those new social workers who entered our workforce yesterday, possibly at one of the most daunting times that, that it's possible to imagine. Um, but I think on behalf of the committee, to wish them all well, they carry a heavy load in the sense that they represent some of the most disadvantaged. They advocate for them. They sometimes stand between them and some of the, uh, some of the oppressions and, and disadvantage that they, they face on a regular basis. Uh, I also want to wish at the other end of that education spectrum um, young people who are currently receiving offers to take up social work as a career, and I think it's very commendable that, that people are doing that. So thank you for that. Um, in terms of a couple of questions from myself, first of all, uh, you raised the issue there about looked after children um, reviews, which have been stood down due to, due to the COVID, and you say that it shouldn't be placed into a backlog. But I'm wondering what other what what proposals do you have, or how should those be dealt with so that they don't form a backlog that will create difficulties? Well, I think what we need to see, Chair, is, is a very clear plan uh, and some kind of audit uh, around the number of uh, reviews that are going to be in such circumstances. I mean, obviously, as you know yourself, there, there's a very uh, clear timeline um, in place in terms of stipulating the levels of reviews and or regulations that we're discussing today uh, enable some flex within that system. But those children still need um, to have their needs reviewed. There'll still need to be a review process. And we need to have some kind of system in place that timetables um, a workable and realistic um, method to, to review those, those cases in a timely fashion. To simply stack them up and discover in six months' time that we have a significant tranche of, of, of reviews to be tackled in one go would simply, I think, be, be too daunting for the system to cope with. Okay, thank you. And then in relation to, as you have rightly and, and helpfully pointed out, the issue of uh, mental health, uh, additional problems that we will face as a result of poverty and, and all of those issues, um, what's your assessment of the level of engagement that's going on currently with social work to ensure that a surge in those demand in those services will be properly planned for and that the resources will be in place? I think one thing that we know from, from our members, Chair, is that one of the areas where there, there continues to be a really significant amount of work going on is within mental health services. Um, we, we know that members are, are still have incredibly heavy caseloads. They're maintaining contact with uh, the, the people who use their services, either uh, by phone or by video link. And in many of the, the circumstances, they're still continuing to visit. Um, Again, we highlighted a report, I think, at, at the front end, the sharp end of services for people who need assessed under the mental health order. Um, you know, there are incredibly worrying um, situations. Social workers are, are engaged in calls. Uh, and we know that a lot of people with mental health difficulties, particularly those who would have a severe and enduring mental illness, uh, psychotic illness, um, have adapted uh, into their delusional belief system um, some kind of responsibility um, for the spread of this pandemic which leaves them incredibly distressed and, and upset and it means that they present a, a real risk to themselves at times. So social workers are, are very much engaged um, uh, and continue to be engaged in the front line in terms of offering support. I think one thing we would say um, is that uh, mental health services have faced really very significant cuts um, for a long period of time. They're often described as the Cinderella service 
uh, within uh, HSC. And over many years of efficiency savings and cutbacks, um, they have been one of the first uh, areas to be uh, to be reduced. So there is a real significant need, I think. Um, we, we need as a society uh, to have discussion and debate um, about the kind of services that we want to offer, not just in, in terms of mental health, I think, but across uh, our society. Um, and we need uh, to ensure, using the knowledge that we have, um, to ensure that we have adequate uh, services, support services, uh, that's not just statutory services. Uh, we need voluntary community, third sector. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity to really um, take hold, uh, to make use of the fact that um, we've seen a real surge in, in community spirit and communities coming together to support each other, to look out for each other and, and to meet needs. Uh, and I think social work is very well placed um, to be involved in that uh, community development um, post-COVID. Uh, and we've seen some really good examples of that within um, mental health teams and, and within our uh, primary care, multidisciplinary primary care teams, where social workers are continuing to really engage with, um, with patients uh, and with uh, communities um, and look at really innovative ways to meet people's needs during the lockdown. But undoubtedly, there's going to need to be a strategic approach to planning for that um, post-lockdown. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm now going to go to, to members' questions. I have one indication in the room at this stage, and then, which is Paula, and then I'm going to go to the phones, and then I'll come back into the room. So I'll go to Paula first. Good morning, um, guys, and it's great that you're here this morning. Um, between um, tea time last night and 20 to 12, I received three new um, contacts from men who were not getting access to their children due to the breakdown in the contact orders with the courts being closed. Um, as you know, I see parental alienation as a form of child abuse, and you've mentioned that today. And I'm just wondering what you, your social workers, are doing at the minute to try and mi uh, mitigate against these breakdowns in these contact orders, and how you're going to feed into those plans that you had mentioned there in terms of working with the department, in terms of addressing the backlog and the impact that it has had on the children and their parents from the, the break in contact. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, obviously, it's one area that um, is causing enormous concern, and um, we know that the Health and Social Care Board has worked alongside all of the different directors of social work across the trust um, to try and provide some guidance to, to staff. Um, we, we know that direct face-to-face -face contact um, in public law uh, cases at this stage um, cannot safely be facilitated, um, and so social workers have been involved in notifying parents and children um, of, of those decisions um, and trying to, um, to mitigate that, the loss of face-to-face -face contact by ensuring there is um, contact by phone, by Skype uh, and by you know, a variety of different electronic solutions. It obviously won't replace that face-to-face -face contact, but uh, as I say, decisions have been taken at this stage, it, it's simply not safe to, to continue to facilitate. Um, in, in terms of uh, private law, I mean, there's obviously delays, as you'll know, within the court service in terms of um, courts uh, uh, ceasing to operate in, in certain circumstances. Uh, and again, we know that um, private um, contact services have been suspended, which obviously interferes with, uh, with, with parents and children having time together. Uh, again, there was helpful guidance um, earlier um, as the pandemic, uh, 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 the, as the pandemic uh, evolved in terms of uh, clear uh, clarity for parents who, who were separated that they could continue to, um, to, to see their children um, and what their households would be considered uh, as one household. It was safe to, to transport between those uh, in terms of making those arrangements for themselves. Uh, but we do know there's a significant impact um, on, on contact, and I think it's one of the challenges um, that you rightly highlight. Well, just to come back, I have to say the, the guidance was well, well crafted, but the reality of it is that was three last night. I would probably get about five a day from parents. Obviously, people know that this is a, an issue that I um, campaign on, but it's clearly not working. So there has to be a new solution to maintaining that. They're not doing the virtual online FaceTime chats. It's just not happening, and it's very, very distressing. One of the people who contacted me last night, their, their children had stolen their mother's phone, quickly said, I love you, Daddy, before the mummy snatched the phone back off them and put it down. This is, a, this is the reality of what's actually happening and what we are hearing as elected representatives. Thank you, Paula. Um, I'm going to go across now to the phones. Um, do we have Pam there? Pam, are you on the phone? 
I am, yes. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you uh, to the panel for your your presentation uh, today. You've covered quite a lot of, of my questions anyway, but just for um, some clarity, in particular around, um, you know, social workers, we know that mental health and domestic violence related cases are going to have a, a greater long term impact due to the lockdown period. And uh, so will there be additional support given to cases following COVID-19? And I'd also ask you what, um, how you are working with the voluntary sector to ensure those in need get that help and support that they that they need, and, and which is often life-saving help and support. And I'm very aware um, that the likes of um, our glass and and Women's Aid are not getting the uplift in calls that they would ex expect to be getting. And this is very worrying because we know that there are uh, that there will be an increase in domestic violence, for example, at this time. But actually, getting help for the victim in lockdown is is virtually impossible. So, what what is your thoughts on that? And where do we go as restrictions start to ease, and then hopefully the the, the calls will come to those third sector organisations so that so that people can get the help that they need. Thank you, Pam. Absolutely, and, and we, we share your concerns uh, around the, 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 re the reduction in the number of uh, referrals coming through in relation to domestic violence. We, we see that and we know from, uh, from colleagues working across HSC that referrals, uh, general referrals have, have decreased and, and certainly referrals in relation to domestic violence have decreased. Um, we, we have been working very closely um, with Women's Aid uh, and, and supporting their campaigns to try and highlight the fact that despite the fact that the, the way they work has necessarily had to change, that they are still there. They're still there to support uh, women and children uh, and anyone who is um, uh, dealing with uh, domestic violence. Um, we, we know that they continue to, to reach out. There's been a social media campaigns which we've been keen to support. We've done a podcast with them recently to try and, and to highlight the issue. Uh, and again, I know the trusts are doing the same uh, in terms of trying to get that message out there using all the means they can to say although things have changed services are still here if you are worried about a child or about a family please get in touch and i think uh, we, we, we have to make use of the fact that um you know child protection and, and child safeguarding is everyone's responsibility and now more than ever we, we need to rely on our communities uh, on neighbors um, if there are concerns, um, if people have queries, they can make contact uh, either with one of the voluntary or community groups or with statutory services to seek advice uh, and they'll find staff there who will be able to talk them through their concerns um, and offer them some guidance. Um, in terms of uh, our society emerging from, um, from, from lockdown, absolutely it's one of the things we are very concerned about. In trying to to look at that, I mean, I referenced it in, in in the briefing. The social work response is going to be on a very different time scale to the acute hospital response, uh, and thus far, necessarily, we've been very focused on, um, you know, numbers of people um, being admitted uh, to hospitals with COVID, recovery rates, infection rates. We're starting to see that to be a move now in terms of residential care, but uh, it, it's often forgotten, I think, that uh, there will be a huge uh, impact on our communities in a whole variety of ways and we really need to ensure that there is um, planning that, that starting now if not already has started to try and plan that we have the services that we need uh, and that will require some difficult I think discussions to be had and decisions to be made around funding levels uh, and the kind of services that we need to pick up on the needs that we know are going to come um, post lockdown. I would say just even uh, looking. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Andrew. Sorry, Stanley. Just coming in. In terms of in terms of the wave that Carolyn has identified, we've talked about the acute wave, talked about the wave that is coming for children's services for mental health, and then also mentioned in the brief the impacts of poverty. It's an issue that Basel had done a huge amount of campaigning on, going back a number of months prior to lockdown, particularly in relation to welfare reform uh, and universal credit. 
uh, and we've engaged primarily with um, the Department for Communities and the Communities Minister. One of the issues we highlighted in, in relation to that work was when the Communities Minister takes forward her anti-poverty framework that's got to tie in with the work of the Department for Health in relation to mental health, in relation to child welfare. It's got to tie in with um, other departments in relation to economic development. It's, it's the extent to which these um, social problems arising from poverty that social workers end up dealing with um, to, to essentially address um, the outcomes. I mean, Carolyn had mentioned um, uh, suicide rates, for example, in relation to the most deprived areas of Northern Ireland. If you look at 2018 figures, there was 307 deaths by suicide in Northern Ireland, and 64 were in the most deprived areas compared to 14 in the least deprived. So it's essential that there is the executive um, I suppose led in relation to the, the work of the Minister for Communities, but very much involving Department for Health is addressing these really deep-rooted impacts that are leading to the social problems that social workers are dealing with at the, at the, at the hard edge of it. Thank you. Um, Orlea, are you there on the phone at the minute? Yes, thank you, Chair. And um, hello, Carlin and Andy. Lovely to hear from you again. Um, I completely agree with everything that's already been said. Um, and the, uh, all the, the sort of anecdotal evidence is showing that the referrals are down across community and statutory agencies. Um, ED admissions for those in crisis are down. Self-harm referral rates are down. But the worry is that this is going to be um, a really quickly changing picture because it's, it's almost you're going to have the, the surge post-COVID is going to be a, 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 a mental health, poor mental health surge in my opinion. Um, and we do need to be ready to deal with it. So just a couple of wee questions. See, with the, you were talking about the small number of high-risk cases um, that social workers are still dealing with, including the mental health assessment. Um, although it's a small number, have you, in the context of the, the lockdown, have you seen any increase or decrease in, in those numbers of mental health um, assessments? Because it was just interesting, me, even Carlin, when you had mentioned some of the patients who are already mentally um, ill, feeling uh, like a level of responsibility for um, the pandemic. So, it'll be interested to know has there been any increase in in those um, those types of assessments? The guidance um, for uh, social work home visits. I mean, is that guidance? Is anything in the pipeline for that? Is it being drafted? Is the department working on it? Um, or, or where is that sitting? Or has it been agreed that there's no guidance required? It'd just be interested to know on where that's going. And then, just finally. The broader stuff about, you know, um, like how we plan strategically coming out of this, we all need to do that at every level. Um, and obviously, the, the, with the, the mental health budget, um, we, we still need the funding for Protect Life 2. Um, we need to get the mental health action plan published and action. Um, so I'm just wondering, have you had any input um, or conversations with the Department of Health um, into that action plan? And, and any feedback, because I know some of the, the trust senior management um, is working on uh, plans uh, within the, the mental health um, section of the trust. So have you had any feedback or any conversations with the trust and with the Department of Health? Thanks. Thank you, Aurelia. Um, panel, please. Thank you. Um, I'll maybe address the mental health uh, issue in terms of numbers first, and then ask Andy to, to speak to the, the, the question around guidance. Um, in relation to the, the, the number of referrals uh, for mental health, we, unfortunately, uh, or we don't have figures from that at this stage. Um, it would be interesting, I think, to see those figures. Uh, what we know is just in, in terms of contact we have through members, uh, and we have a number of forums where we, we bring together social workers from across Northern Ireland to discuss kind of practice issues and, and their experiences during COVID. So certainly um, we, we know uh, from, from those calls that uh, certainly uh, levels in terms of call-outs for proof social workers are, aren't down. So there, there's no sense of there being any increased capacity within the system. Um, the, 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 the pandemic um, and lockdown has coincided, I suppose, um, shortly after the introduction of mental capacity legislation. So there were real um, pressures within the mental health uh, system and within mental health social work where we have quite a, a small number of staff uh, but I think some of the good things we know is that there has been a regional approach to um, looking at the approved social work workforce. Um, they were one of the first groups um, who were able to access PPE, I think, in recognition of the, of the risky situations that, that they were going out to. 
But certainly, I think it would be interesting to try and analyse the information and the data around referral rates and the number of uh, mental health order assessments that have been undertaken. That could be something that uh, the executive could, uh, or the, sorry, the assembly could, committee could take forward. Thanks, Carl. Andy, do you want to address the uh, issue uh, in relation to guidance? Sure, sure. Um, in relation to the, you know, the guidance that we've been discussing this morning concerning uh, the regulations, it states that prior to visiting a private household, social workers and social care staff should assess whether any member of the household has suspected or is confirmed of having COVID-19 and in order to determine whether PPE is needed. If PPE is needed, the appropriate guidance public, published by Public Health England should be followed. Now, the issue with that, from our point of view, is that the, the Public Health England guidance was shared with us on the 3rd of April um, by the Department of Health. Um, and it explains that in community care settings, PPE should be used where direct care is being provided. Um, now, the, the problem with the guidance is that it's essentially clinical in its focus. Uh, it does have some transferable relevance to social work, but it doesn't really address uh, scenarios for social work. Um, so it, part of the problem with the, P, the PEHE guidance is that it, it asks that, you know, if there's any member of the household that is a possible or confirmed case, and it, this assumes that social workers can establish with the people being visited whether they or someone on their behalf can and, and will reliably communicate whether or not they're symptomatic or have a diagnosis. And, you know, it's Baz's view that that's thoroughly unrealistic. Um, you know, it's, it's not possible for the social worker to guarantee that they're going to be provided with that information. So on that basis, our assessment is if you're a social worker and you're going out to visit um, uh, for, you know, the, uh, child um, protection or mental health um, context, that your risk assessment will determine that you're going to need to use PPE because you can't guarantee whether or not you're going to be told um, whether there is a possible or confirmed case. So it kind of goes about saying that PPE needs to be used. Um, I think a big concern for us in all of this has been, you know, we have now that um, there's the new intake of um, social work students with around about 6,600 social workers in Northern Ireland. About a third of them work in children's services. We know that, that it's been paired back dramatically. So the actual demand for PPE for social work is small, although the risk to the social workers that need it, the risk is high. So, you know, it's something which has been, uh, has been troubling for social workers to feel that they haven't necessarily had um, the guidance and the access to PPE that they've needed going back over the last number of weeks throughout the crisis. Um, the discussions we've had with the Health and Social Care Board and with members now indicate that social workers are getting the PPE they need. But in relation to Ola, not Ola, sorry, that, that specific um, social work focus guidance, um, uh, we have no understanding whether or, not, whether or not that is going to be produced by the department. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and I suppose just, just at that point, just to acknowledge members on the phone, um, just, just to, for, to acknowledge the fact that your attending on the phone has allowed the committee to continue uninterrupted with this meeting and still maintain the social distancing. I know it's a little bit more difficult, but we appreciate the fact that, that members have facilitated that. So coming back now into the, the chamber here and Jerry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Carlene and Andy, for your, your presentation and your um, responses. Uh, I would concur with your concerns about the mental health services and the connections to poverty and we obviously need to address it um, as a matter of urgency now with the spike that we'll likely see after the um, coronavirus hopefully passes. Um, my understanding is most patients in care homes uh, have a trust care manager who are mostly social workers. Um, are you aware um, whether these care managers from the trusts are visiting care homes to check on residents? Um, and are there, uh, if, you, if, if that is the case, uh, have you heard concerns about PPE or staffing issues raised? And I think your briefing obviously mentioned concerns uh, about uh, PPE. Would you just be confident that all social workers have appropriate or adequate PPE at this time? Yeah. Panel, please. Uh, Jerry, thank you. Um, to take the, the issue of, of social workers in, engaging uh, with homes, uh, certainly um, there are named staff. There are slightly different systems across each different trust. Um, but certainly, uh, most people who are in a, a residential or nursing home will have uh, will have social work contact um, and and would uh, be would, would have a key worker. That sometimes will be a nurse and sometimes will be a social worker. 
But what we do know is that uh, in most circumstances, um, visits are not being carried out into uh, residential and nursing homes in terms of uh, minimising risk and, and following um, the guidance as set out by, uh, by, public, by Public Health England. Uh, we know that social workers are maintaining contact by phone and by, um, by uh, electronic uh, contact. Um, but in instances where they are, um, uh, the risks are such that they need to be involved in a home visit uh, and certainly in an improved social work situation. We know that continues to happen uh, in terms of someone who may need a mental health order assessment um, uh, within the home. Then at this stage, we, we, we're assured that social workers have access um, to PPE. Um, we don't necessarily uh, represent the, um, the social care sector. So most of our feedback uh, in relation to what's happening within that sector would, would come from the social workers um, who've had contact with their colleagues working uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the homes. Initially, you know, uh, and we've had the descriptions um, of, of care home managers uh, pleading with their social work staff to try and help them get adequate PPE for their staff um, within the homes. Um, and I know that uh, lots of other people have, have spoken on that across, uh, you know, radio um, and, uh, and TV are probably better placed to comment on that, uh, Jerry, in this instance. Um, but we also know that, for example, you know, social workers um, are, are stepping up to the mark and, and volunteering to do lots of different tasks. Um, and so social workers, for example, are involved in um, coordinating the, the, the swab tests. And actually, some social workers are volunteering to, to work um, additional hours and, uh, and carry out swab tests under, under obviously, with, with training and guidance. And I'm wondering in relation to the PPE, if uh, there's anything else that we need to add at this stage or if you're satisfied, maybe Andy wants to add to that? Um, just, the, um, Jerry, the most recent contacts we've had with members at the beginning of this week um, across the different trusts and across programmes of care was confirming that, that PPE is now available um, when and where it is needed. It's just disappointing that there has been the mixed messaging from HSC that did cause a huge amount of stress and worry for members. Um, if we go back a number of, of weeks, on the 9th of April, and the Chief Social Worker Briefs Committee and in directly in response to your question from the Deputy Chair about social workers' access to PPE, he said that for the vast majority of social work activities, PPE isn't required and social distancing should be followed. I think what really, really troubled our members in relation to that statement was the vast majority of social work visits aren't going ahead. So where the visits are going ahead in those high-risk circumstances, well, we know from research we've done you know, going back a couple of years, social workers do often face intimidation and sometimes even explicit threats and, and sometimes violence as well. You know, you, you add to that the pressure cooker situation of the COVID-19 lockdown and you're sending staff out in, you know, kind of deeply concerning circumstances. So that's why we felt that uh, PPE was uh, a must-have um, for those visits. Um, so when we were told that for, for most social work activities PPE wasn't needed. Our view is that most social work activities aren't going ahead as planned and for those that are going ahead as planned PPE is necessary. But thankfully the following week when PHA briefed committee there was clarification brought to that situation um, and that is essentially that based on a dynamic risk assessment um, PPE should be used um, if there is a um, suspected concern of, of, uh, uh, of COVID infection. So that reassured us a lot um, but Yes, so to summarise, PPE is now available. It's in place where it's needed, when it's needed. Um, there has been concern caused for the profession during the last number of weeks because of a lack of clarity from HSC messaging. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, I think that's almost us. There's one final question just that has occurred to me in, in the course of the discussion, and it's around an issue that was raised earlier with communication with many of what are many often marginalised communities here and I think the COVID pandemic has highlighted that um, and I suppose all all organs of any society should be representative of the, of the society they serve. So I'm just wondering in terms of particular marginalised groups around issues around language and indeed sign language around cultural issues within social work uh, what what steps are being taken to ensure that, that uh, people are 
broadly representative and that people have skills and language to engage with many of these communities? Uh, I think to, to pick up on that point, I mean, I think one of the areas where there um, is, is real concern uh, and a focus, I think, a focus moving to looking at trying to support um, children, young people and families where there, where there are disabilities. Uh, and I know that within disability services, um, there's particular concern, I think, around the, the extreme pressures um, that are uh, being faced within families. Not necessarily, obviously, in terms of, uh, of language, in terms of sign language, but other dis disabilities necessarily. Um, where there are extreme pressures uh, within those households, um, given the, the measures that have been put in place in terms of reducing contact and reducing visits and the loss of um, short break respite services, um, it has been particularly challenging. Uh, and I know that um, social workers, I think, have continued uh, in, in some circumstances to, to go beyond the, um, the, the telephone and uh, electronic contact. And we, we've heard stories of social workers who are you know, going out to, to help people um, do their shopping, do cooking, um, and, and, and lots of practical ways getting involved to try and support um, people who are really isolated and really vulnerable uh, and try and maintain um, that, that contact. For some people, it's the, the only um, sort of source of contact they have. Um, so I, I think we are seeing, and I, hopefully that will emerge, that we're, we're seeing and hearing lots of stories of quite innovative practice uh, and new ways of working for, with, with people. I hope that um, we, we take some of that learning and um, don't assume post-lockdown that you know, we simply return to how everything was because I think there'll be some things that we've learned work better, strangely, uh, and we need to make sure we capture that um, to make sure we work with everyone in the best way possible. Um, I'm not sure that necessarily answers your question, Chair. But um... well, no, well, well, I, I agree with all that. I was, I was thinking more specifically around foreign national communities, around people with uh, hearing difficulties. But social workers very often have the skills, the experience, and the knowledge to act as a bridge to those communities. And I think the uh, the, the the necessity to have good community support and understanding of how we respond to the pandemic highlights the fact that that uh, maybe those communities are vastly usually typically vastly underrepresented in social work. So I'm wondering if there's any programs being considered to improve that. I think, Chair, what, what we know is that where, where people are known to services or where someone gets in touch, um, they are getting support. Uh, it may be different support, as I say, than they would normally have had. But in terms of, say, young um, uh, unaccompanied children, um, asylum-seeking families, those services are all, are all still running. They're still there. They're still involved. Um, they're, they're trying to support in every way they possibly can, mindful of the risk you know, that their contact presents to that family and the risk necessarily presented to them. So, I mean, we, we know across the piece um, that whilst things are operating differently and social workers may not be out in people's homes at this stage, they are still very, very much engaged in uh, supporting uh, people, um, whether they live alone, whether they live as part of families or different community uh, and group care settings. Um, and they're, you know, they're doing what they always would have done, which is respond to the information that they have, that whole process of dynamic risk assessment and professional judgment is, you know, is integral and is vital to social work practice. Uh, and I think we are seeing that our social workers um, are really stepping up to the plate uh, and doing um, what they can to support uh, people in these the most trying of times, really. Okay. Thank you. And just, I suppose, in, in relation to that, uh, I'm, I'm very acutely aware of the difficulties that many people who are, are caring for adults and children with learning disability at the present time, um, they have lost access to day centres, they've lost access to short breaks, and those carers are struggling. And I would just urge everyone involved in providing support for them to do all they can and as quickly as they can to, to support that sector. I just want to go but finally then to Colin for, for a short Sorry for not indicating yeah. earlier, and I'll be, it's a quick question, and I'll be very happy with just a very short answer. Um, it's just that at the beginning of this process, many social workers who operate out of community service centres, where they are in big shared offices, um, they were um, a bit concerned about the, um, their safety because they were being required to come in and work out of those offices rather than from home. Are you satisfied that the sector, um, that social workers are being given the, uh, every opportunity to operate from home where, where necessary? Yes, and um, we know that that picture has changed. Certainly we would have shared your concerns in the early days 
a lot of staff were coming in to shared offices where it was not possible to operate social distancing. There were some concerns around, you know, uh, cleaning happening in the offices, uh, 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 and that was a real concern. But what we understand now is that where staff can work from home, they are being and able to work from home. And uh, certainly, we we haven't had recent contact uh, from people concerned that they're being required to go into work. Um, so I do think we feel reassured on that. That um, steps have been taken to make sure that staff are safe. But we thank remain you. vigilant uh, and ensure that, that that continues. Okay, thank you. So, Carolyn and Andy, thank you both very much for your presentation today, for your answers, and on behalf of the committee, just to wish you and, and everyone out there working in, in the field of social work well at this time and into the future. Thank you, Cora Thanks, thanks for your time. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Members now turning to correspondence. Um, can I refer members to correspondence at tab 7 of your pack and table papers and to the correspondence memo at, memo at tab 7.1? So I'd like to draw members' attention to a number of items. Firstly, there are item 7.4 is from the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists. Uh, I took the opportunity offered to have an informal conversation with the college this week further to their letter. And, um, I did, as, as you will have observed there, raise it also with the PHA. But um, I suppose, do members, have a, uh, do members have a view on how we should progress that? We could either raise with the Minister at the next opportunity, we could write to the Department advising we're concerned about the issues and requesting a copy of their response, or if it's been addressed earlier by PHA officials, but I don't think it has been directly. I think maybe if we write to the Minister, uh, go ahead. No, I, I, it's something that I've been working on this week as well, and I think I've heard informally that the minister is looking into this, but I think they um, would like confirmation of that. So I think the earlier week, earliest we can get a response, the better. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Pam, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I've also been speaking to them as well this week, and, and uh, agree with Paula. And I've already sent this on to the minister, but I think it's really it would seem to be a very common sense move, regardless of. Um, where they are in terms of debate around the, the, the appropriate level of PPE for speech and language therapists. But given that they're in with COVID wards, they are um, an incredible comfort to many COVID patients who, who may be reaching the end of their life in terms of communicating with loved ones. And they, I know they assist doing that. But also they, they're keeping the flow of discharge going at hospitals because they need to get in to do those really vital assessments um, to, in terms of their swallow to see you know how they can progress and actually how you know for patients who are recovering from the, the worst of it being intubated and the rest of it so i think it's i think it would be a common sense approach to to take um okay. a very precautionary view and allow them access to the the, the highest protection of ppe given those circumstances, I, I think it just was a common sense approach. So I think it is very important that we do follow up with the department on it and, and get that response from as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. So there, therefore, I propose we write to the department advising that we are concerned about the issues raised and requesting a copy of the response when it issues. Are members agreed? Agreed. Item 7.7 .7 is from an independent physiotherapy practitioners, highlighting the difficulties being experienced by physiotherapy practices during the pandemic and seeking the committee's support. Um, so I note that Pam has already indicated she has forwarded a letter. Although the letter suggests independent physiotherapists are comparable to dentists and pharmacists, they may be distinct in not having HSE contracts. Uh, so the financial support being sought by these may be better directed at Department of Finance though their closure could arguably create significant pressure, additional pressure on HSC. Um, so I was just wondering then, would, would, Pam, would you be content to keep the committee updated in relation to this issue? Yes, I would, I would absolutely. And um, I, I think it is, it is obviously something that um, needs good economy as well, but I think there is a, an impact on, on health, so it's important that they're made very aware of it. And we're hearing a lot of... Um, uh, people who recover from COVID actually the difficulty in, in walking and also you can see that they're going to be at, well have always been vital physiotherapy is you know a very vital service regardless but I think probably more now than ever so I think that 
the health department need to recognise and ensure that the that those services and that expertise remains there and is there, um, and that you know the fallout financially doesn't mean that we're you know short on uh, physiotherapy practitioners. Okay, so um, are members therefore content to note pending a reply from the minister? Yeah, yeah members content. Uh, item 7.8 is from CO3, highlighting the financial impact of COVID-19 on charities, on the voluntary organisations and social enterprises. Um, myself and a couple of other members of the committee were involved in, a, in an informal discussion with that sector during the week, and I think there, there are, there are real, real concerns there and real issues that they are raising that they need certainty and clarity and, and support. Um, so, Any comments from, from any of the members in relation to that? Paula. Yeah, Paula first and then Pam. I see this morning that the Communities Minister has announced that there is going to be some support for, for charities, um, but I, there's not much detail in it. So I suppose our question then to not just health but also communities is really when are they going to get the finer details and when are the applications going to be open for um, the groups to apply? Okay. Pam. Yeah, um, yeah, I've been involved in that call too and, and we did and it, we keep coming back to the same subjects, but it's absolutely vital that we do. And that was good news that we received in terms of um, funding for hospices, which is very much to be welcomed. But again, when you look at uh, like the services in relation to domestic violence, and we know um, that, that their services are going to be needed more than ever as lockdown restrictions ease. So it's really vital that, that these organisations are supported because the need will be, will be greater than it was before. Substantially, so I think it is really important. So I uh, um, certainly back um, Paula's ask there that um, that we we get some more information around what funding is available to those um, third sector organisations. Okay, and and recognising that a large proportion of those issues are, are maybe related more to the Department of Communities, but would we would would members be content that we write to the department to ask them to provide greater certainty for charities with which it has ser service level agreements in place, um, and to give a, to to respond to that? Are members agreed with that approach? Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Thank you. Moving on, members to. Item 7.12 is from the Multiple Sclerosis Society, highlighting issues MS sufferers are experiencing during the pandemic and requesting that the committee put those to the department. Are members content to write to the department raising the issues as set out? Okay. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, there was an issue raised about individual cures and PPE, um, which I don't think has been actually fully addressed or, or addressed satisfactorily. So we may want to write back to the MS Society asking, advising of that, asking for their view on the PPE for individual cures. Would members also be content with that? Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so are members otherwise content with the actions as noted in the correspondence memo in the main pack? Sure. Yes, sir. Just on seven point one four, the minister's response uh, around abortion services. I'm coming. Um, I'm coming to that in table papers. Okay, I'm coming to that in table apologies, papers. Apologies. So, but in in terms of the main pack, are members content with the items noted there? Thank you. Um, item then moving on then to the table papers. Item seven point one three is a response from the department to the committee's correspondence on the legislative consent mo motion on private international law. Are members content to write back requesting that the department consult the committee on any related regulations? Yes. Yeah, right. members content. Item 7.14 is from the minister responding to correspondence forwarded from individuals in respect of abortion services. The response confirms current arrangements in line with previous correspondence. Jerry, who are you looking in on that? Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, it's my understanding that women are still being uh, refused access to surgical abortions. Pills are being administered to some women, uh, but abortion has been decriminalised, as people will know, but people are still forced to travel. I mean, that's bad enough in any circumstance, but it's even worse in the middle of a health uh, pandemic. And the minister's response reply doesn't really uh, give a reason why that's the case. So can I suggest we write to the minister seeking clarity why it's the case that women are still being forced to travel and can't uh, get access to uh, surgical uh, abortions here? Members' views on that? Members content? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Um, item 7.15 is a response from the Minister in relation to our query on the General Dental Service Financial Support Scheme, confirming changes made to address concerns. Are members content to note that item? Content. 
Item 7.16 is correspondence from the Committee for Education regarding support available to the childcare sector during the pandemic, requesting that the Health Committee seek a briefing from the Department of Health on the issues facing the childcare sector and hold a concurrent meeting with the Committee for Education to consider the matter. Um, I think it is, it is since. Claire, could you give us a sort of a wee, there has been a meeting now taking place, is that correct? Um, well, I understand just from seeing the business diary um, this week that a joint briefing did go ahead with the Committee for Education in relation to childcare. Um, and given the other concerns this committee has put on its agenda, uh, it's a matter for this committee to decide if it has the, the time or wants to defer. The other committee could keep us up to date if you wish. Well, I suppose it would make sense to get an up-to-date at least on that meeting and then see how we proceed if there's still need. So could we get that up-to-date? Based on that meeting, and we'll we'll decide then. Okay, thank you. Item 7.17 is a copy of correspondence from an individual to the ministers for health and justice, expressing concerns that the new mental health champion will not have the power to drive effective change in mental health services. Can I suggest to members that the committee note the issues pending future scrutiny of mental health, and that the committee reply to the individual? noting that he has written to the Ministers for Health and Justice and advising that the committee would be interested in any replies he may receive to inform our consideration of mental health services at a later stage. Are members agreed? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I know the constituent, um, I think he's doing some amazing work. I, I suppose it's something maybe even for the Forward Work Programme going forward past the pandemic that we really do engage with him because he's, he's very clear in, in terms of what would need to change legislatively in terms of, of this issue. So. I welcome the, the recommendation, but I think it's something we do need to keep on top of. Okay. Thank you. Um, item 7.18 is an email from an individual concerned about sick pay provision for care workers in the independent sector. Uh, can I suggest the committee respond to this individual, informing her that the committee agrees that reform of adult social care, including conditions for staff, is required, that we will continue to raise this with the department, and suggesting that she contact the relevant charities directly with regards to funds which are being raised for the health service? Are we agreed in that respect? Thank you. So, moving on then, uh, uh, members to forward work, can I refer you to to the draft forward work programme at tab 8.1 of the pack. I advise members that since the executive will now be meeting on Thursday mornings, the minister will not be able to brief the committee at our usual time. So we are discussing how we make alternative arrangements to ensure that those briefings take place on a regular basis and in a way that allow members a chance to raise questions and engage proactively with the minister and CMO. So we'll, we'll continue with those. Our members. Content to note that forward work programme in that respect? Chair. Yeah. Uh, Pam, yes. Yeah, Chair. Just on another, I was just um, thinking this week that, and it kind of went around um, public response to the pandemic, and I think we're all a bit concerned going forward about um, complacency, and uh, we know there will be probably further waves of this. Fast, and I think it would be really good and very important if we could invite uh, Charlotte McArdle as the Chief Nursing Officer to brief the committee on kind of the experiences or the reality of nursing COVID-19 patients. I just think it would be very useful to hear firsthand about those challenges. Um, uh, and I think she could bring along maybe a doctor as well for that briefing, um, just so that we can raise awareness uh, about the importance of adhering to whatever the rules and guidelines are at any particular time during this pandemic. Yeah. So. Okay, Pam, thank you. And I think, I think given the level of issues that are arising and given the level of concern, this will probably involve additional meetings of the committee. We've already agreed that we will, we will consider that where appropriate in order to get the work that's, that's so much needed. So, um, Members happy to to note that to look to seek a briefing from the CMO at some point, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm not sure how long the executive meetings go on for. Um, there might be a few hours uh, these days. But if the, if the health minister can't make or is unavailable for the health committee, can I suggest we try and have a, a briefing uh, on Wednesday if if necessary, if the Thursday um, sitting is um, not possible. Although those are the issues I'm considering, and I'll, I'll I'll come back to you as whenever we have established what's the best way to move forward on that. Sure. Yes, uh, Pam. Sorry. Yes, just for clarity, that was. Uh, uh, I would like to say if we could ask the, um, the chief. 
Yes. 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 Nursing officer. Yes. No. I'm Chief not. nursing officer. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Charlotte McArdle. That's fine, Pam. Thank you. So, uh, members, content to note the forward work programme. Then, Colin. Yeah, could, could we get the RQIA for next week? Just I think there's been sufficient issues addressed today, and I think it would do no harm. And I think if we go too many weeks in advance. A lot of the issues could be lost, and I think if there's concern out there, it would be important to have them, um, just to be able to, to update us on what, what they're doing in, in their statutory role um, for, for care homes. Uh, and maybe also just the, the chief nursing officer there, G given what maybe the deputy chair w was suggesting, if, if it's a, a sort of spectrum, if we're looking at what we're going to do in the future, like we could bring all sectors along for, for that, you know, because every sector will have different yeah. points. M might it be, a, as you have suggested, a theme for a specific meeting? Might be about what we're going to do going forward, and then we could have the chief medical officer, the chief nursing officer, if required, the social workers, if, you know, the allied care. So, you know, but just having everybody together at one meeting, looking at that, because if you're to go week for week, there's probably about a dozen organisations out there that need to give some clarity as to how they're moving forward. So I don't know if that is an option. Um, well, something I think certainly we can we can look at in relation to RQIA. I think given the concern around care homes, that is that that would be a useful. Clerk, can you advise? Would that be practical? Could we look for? We can certainly uh, ask the officials to come for next yeah. week. Okay, so agreed with that. Thank you. Moving on then to any other business. Do members have any other business? No, no other business. Thank you. Okay, members, just to advise that the date, time, and place of next meeting. The next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. on Thursday, 14th of May, 2020. Room to be confirmed. Thank, Thank you. you. Is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed? This 